Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Building Resilience Through Sustainable Urban Water Management Forum. To begin with, I am delighted to invite Professor Jimmy Fong, Director of Hong Kong UST's Institute for the Environment, to deliver his welcoming speech. Jimmy, please. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, HAUSD Business School campus. And uh, most of the time, uh, they use this venue for running their EMBA program. Uh, but luckily enough, during the daytime, they don't have classes. And we are lucky enough to use this venue have with this wonderful CVU. Uh, on behalf of uh, HKUSD, I would like to welcome you all and joining this event. And I would like to first thank the Dutch Consular General in supporting this event, especially he has brought us two distinguished speakers home from all the way long from Netherlands to Hong Kong to share with us their advanced water technology and experiences. We, all, we are also thrilled to have three government departments, the Drinking Service Department, the Water Supplies Department, the Environmental Protection Department, to co-host this event with us, the Institute for the Environment and the Hong Kong Jockey Club Institute for the Advanced Study. We have about 80 uh, government officials here in this room today, and this indicates an even closer collaboration be between academia and the government, which is important and advantage on sharing idea, sharing idea exchanges in sustainability and shaping uh, changing together. The Institute of Environment has long history on climate science research. We held a large scale climate adaptation and resilience conference which we call CARE Conference at the end of last year, which was at the right timing after a couple of severe cyclo number 10 storm incident. CARE Conference has effectively brought 600 delegates to the discussion table. It sprang off a lot of practical ideas and more importantly, has shaped some collaborative initiative to make idea happen. Hong Kong, Hong Kong's two main sources of water are rainfall from natural catchment and Donggong water from Guangdong province. However, we exposed to however we Hong Kong exposed to a very long coastal line susceptible, susceptible to the increased extreme weather event. Hong Kong need to be prepared for climate change and pay more attention in water resilient issues. Individuals and all parties have a role to pay to save the water. And I couldn't wait longer to join all of you to listen to the sharing session today. And I wish you all have a very fruitful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Next, I'm honored to invite Ms. Anamika Roger, Consul General of Netherlands, Consulate General in Hong Kong and Macau, to share some remarks with us. Ms. Roger, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fong, for your very uh, kind introduction. Uh, Professor Lo, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, representatives of the Hong Kong government, I'm very, very happy to be present here on the occasion of uh, the opening of this event. And in particular, we from the Consulate General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands are delighted that we have been able to put this event together with such a large number of crucial stakeholders in Hong Kong, both from academia and government, as Jimmy already mentioned. It started with a very rough idea, which we discussed initially with Professor Christine Lowe, who unfortunately cannot be here today. And finally, it resulted in this event, building resilience through sustainable urban water management. Many, many thanks go to the co-organizer Hong Kong UST, their experts, and to the many colleagues of, from the water supply department, the drainage service department, 
and the Environmental Protection Department of the Hong Kong government, who are present here today. All of whom, with their active participation, their valuable ideas and their input, formulated the themes of this event. For the Consulate General, this event is part of the Dutch Days in Hong Kong Festival. As you can see. We organize this every year in April, and this year is our fifth edition. And the Honorable Carrie Lam officiated at the opening of the festival about a week ago, and she said, and I quote, the Dutch Days is a month-long festival of all things delightfully Dutch, showcasing the Netherlands' remarkable culture, creativity, and innovation. End of quote. You will understand, I will repeat the chief executive's words very often today and this, the rest of this year, and I'll bore my audiences to death with it. The Dutch have a reputation that they know a thing or two about water management. But we should not forget that came out of necessity. For us, with a large part of our country below sea level, it is literally an existential question. Dutch water governance and management began in the Middle Ages, and over the centuries, the Dutch water mindset came to cover not only key aspects, including water management proper spatial planning, but also water supply, water quality, and means to secure a sustainable water supply. We have developed high expertise in drinking water production, water distribution, sewage management, and wastewater treatment, including a high level of recycling of industrial wastewater. So in, 19, sorry, in 2013, the Netherlands was one of three member states of the European Union to fully comply with all three standards of the European Urban Wastewater Directive. Collection, secondary treatment, and advanced treatment. Like Hong Kong, the Netherlands has a high population density, albeit not as high as Hong Kong, but we share the demand for innovative ways to treat wastewater using less space and, of course, if possible, less money. With regard to drinking water, nearly all Dutch households enjoy access to clean drinking water, which is free of chlorine and fluoride. The Dutch water pipe system has a leakage rate of between 3 and 5 percent, for a large extent thanks to the use of advanced sensor technology and, of course, regular maintenance. Today we are going to discuss both these subjects sustainable wastewater management, and leakage challenges. And I, for one, am looking forward to a lively and interesting exchange of views between Dutch and Hong Kong experts and policymakers on these topics. And I'm sure that at the end of the day, we all be the wiser. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ruger. Now it comes to the introduction part before entering section one. We are honored to have drainage services department and water supplies department with us today to give us an overview of the Hong Kong challenges. First, let us welcome Mr. Edwin Lau, Assistant Director of Drainage Services Department to share some remarks with us. Mr. Lau, please. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Annie Mikkel Woodrock, Professor Joseph, uh, Jimmy Fong, all guests and friends. Um, I would like to start my uh, to share what Drainage Services Department DSD is doing. Since the establishment of DSD in 1989, we have two main roles sewage treatment and flood prevention. Coming to this year, we are now celebrating our 30th anniversary, and in a recent ceremony, our, our both Secretary for the Development and the Secretary for the Environment, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Michael Wong 
and Wong Kam Seng has given their remarks that the service provided by the DSD is far more than its name drainage. Just in Cantonese, uh, Mr. Wong Kam Seng uh, said, Kim Ji Koi Mo Kam Gantan. So, yes, indeed. Um, DSD have multiple roles to play in holistic water management and protecting the environment. Like, but like many organizations, we face a lot of challenge uh, on our work, including uh, water pollution and serious flooding incident happened in the past. Victoria Harbour is one of the most variable assets Hong Kong owns. It's therefore our first priority to protect our coastal water by a reliable sewage infrastructure. We commissioned the Harbour Air Treatment Scheme with deep tunnels and a sewage treatment facilities located at the Stonecutter Islands to serve a population of over 5 million people, treating a total volume of 2.5 million cubic meters of sewage every day. This world-class sewage project has won several international awards, but more importantly, we resume the cost harbor ways in the Victoria Harbor. Public needs always drive Hong Kong moving ahead, and we need to take some more steps to achieve our goals. For example, we can make use of the latest state uh, development and the technologies. Relocation of our Sartin sewage treatment plant to, into the cave is a good example where innovative and compact technology, such as the anaerobic granular sludge, AGS, membrane bioreactor, MVR, moving bed biofilm reactor, MVPR, are considered in the project. Also, food waste handling and sewage sludge anaerobic co-digestion, so what we are optimize our energy recovery. I'm very happy that the AGS technology will be addressed later on in by, by our guest speaker from the Netherlands. Another focus of DSD's task is flood prevention. In the past, our primary objective is to convey the service runoff into the sea as quick as possible via our water course, pipes, and drains. But nowadays, as a sustainable strategy, we put more emphasis on planning and integrating our drainage system into a more natural way. We adopt and promote the blue-green infrastructure concept. Blue means water bodies, and green is for the planting. That's a similar concept to the sponge city in the mainland China. We all have the same objectives to address the draining impact in urban setting, enhance water we use and microclimate, and thus improve the living environment for our people. We have implemented water harvesting scheme in our Light Chicago drainage tunnel and Happy Valley underground storage scheme to show the technicality of better use of water resources. These initiatives also demonstrate our aspiration to be innovative and the concept of our water resilience. However, to really put in place the holy blue green concept, we still need to largely collaborate with different stakeholders, including the public and private sectors in an early stage of the development process. In recent year and coming future, our department is facing the aging problem of our drainage assets. Problems like pipe leakage, pipe collapse, have been affecting the quality of our service we are offering to the public. We are very keen to learn how to better perform our drainage assets 
by applying innovative technologies such as the AI, big data, robotic, and real-time monitoring devices. To sum up, we still have plenty of work to do with all of our partners. And to, in order to provide sustainable wastewater and stormwater drainage services in today's forum, I'm sure there will be in-depth and fruitful sharing and discussion on sewage treatment and the water management technologies. Hope uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lau. Without further ado, let us also invite Mr. Roger Wong, Assistant Director of Water Supplies Department, to give us an overview. Mr. Wong, please. Good afternoon, Professor Fong, uh, Mr. Rao Rock, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Hong Kong has been enjoying a very reliable water supply in the past few decades. People have been used to enjoying the convenience of obtaining clean water with a simple turn of the tap. In fact, our Hong Kong water supply service is not free from challenges nowadays. It is my pleasure to share some of the major challenges be set with us in maintaining a sustainable water supply in Hong Kong. To begin with, I would like to give you the background information of water supply in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a compact city with over 7 million population. The local fresh water resources are inadequate to meet our needs. About 70 to 80 percent of our fresh water is imported from Guangdong of our motherland, while the remaining 20 to 30 percent coming from the local rainfall. Due to the high density of population in a small place, our water mains of more than 8,000 kilometers can be highly efficient in terms of the overall scale of water main network per customer. Today, in the interest of time, I would like to focus on the challenges in three major areas including demand management, water loss management, and supply management. We are under tremendous pressure to satisfy the increasing demand for fresh water generated by the growing population. Moreover, the per capita daily domestic consumption in Hong Kong is over 130 liters, relatively high comparing with the world average of 110 liter we see the great importance in containing the fresh water demand. The government has pledged in the 2017 and 2018 policy agenda to reduce the per capita fresh water consumption by 10% by 2030, using 2016 as the base year. To meet the target, we have been taking forward a host of both soft and hard measures in reducing water consumption such as installation of flow controllers in water taps and showers in public rental housing uh, buildings, uh, the government buildings, and also schools. Implementation of mandatory water efficiency labels, uh, labeling scheme in stages and implementation of the automatic meter reading system. It is also high time to raise people's awareness of water resources and make them know that water resources are precious and cannot be taken for granted. Hence, we have been enhancing public education and in, co in collaboration with various stakeholders on promotion of water conservation. The underground nature of water mains is an inherent challenge for water loss management in Hong Kong. Similar to uh, most of the developed, uh, developed countries and places, Water loss in the water distribution network of Hong Kong is a perennial problem and is not easily discovered or detected. The high operating pressure and frequent road excavations usually result in high risk of main bursts and leakage. Difficult access to inspection of water mains due to heavy traffic and congested utilities also poses challenges in maintaining our water supply network. High customer side leakage level poses further challenges in reduction in network leakage. 
Water mains are essential assets for maintaining the services of water supply. Our level of services will be significantly enhanced if our assets are better managed by leveraging the use of advanced technologies and big data nowadays. Thus, we are establishing a water intelligence network by dividing the whole territory into about 2,400 district metering areas, DMAs, and putting in sensors in the water mains of each DMA. Through the collection of data from the DMAs, we can identify those DMAs with water loss problem and for follow-up actions. These actions include active leakage control, pressure management, speedy repair works, and replacement or re rehabilitation of water mains if they are beyond e economic repair. Furthermore, we will develop the intelligent network management system to continuously monitor and analyze the vast amount of network data collected from the DMAs. In respect of the high customer side leakage, we will strengthen our enforcement action and explore master meter charging policy. Our supply side, climate change is an imminent challenge which all uh, cities over the world is facing. Hong Kong cannot escape. The worst weather will give rise to drastic fluctuations in rainfall and its distribution in different places. It is not surprising that droughts may occur in Hong Kong in the near future. Yet another challenge is the competing demand for Dongjiang water in our Pearl, Delta, uh, Pearl River Delta region due to the escalated uh, economic and human activities in the region. To better prepare for the challenges to supply management, our strategy aims to diversify the water resources. We have been striving to exploit alternative water resources, including desalinated seawater and recycled water, namely reclaimed water, treated gray water, and harvested rainwater. On the development of desalinated water, we are going to commence the construction of the first phase of desalination plant in Zhengguan O this year for commissioning in 2022. Capitalizing the upgrading projects of Sat Wu Hui, sewage treatment works of drainage services department, we plan to produce and supply reclaimed water for flushing in the Northeast New Territories in phases starting from Xiang Sui and Fen Neng from 2022 onwards. Besides reclaimed water, we will continue to drive the use of treated gray water and rainwater harvesting systems. For example, a pilot scheme of centralized great water recycling system at the Anderson Road Quarry development site is anticipated to complete in 2022. We believe that with the diversified water resources, it would be effective in, uh, in enhancing our reliability and resilience in water supply of Hong Kong. Sustainable water management has become a major issue in Hong Kong. While we have been implementing various measures in ensuring sustainable water supply to our people. We are also keen on promoting international exchange and collaboration for generating synergy to maximize and expedite the effectiveness. To this end, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region will host an international conference, IWA Aspire, from the 31st of October to the 2nd of November this year. Online registration is open now. Hope to see you all in the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join you all here. I know many experts and academia will share with their value of experience and expertise in sustainable urban water management. I look forward very much to the insights and valuable views in various funds. May I wish you all a very, very fruitful afternoon today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong, please uh, remain on stage. I would now like to invite all of our speakers to come on to the stage for a group photo section. Uh, all speakers, please, please proceed to the front. Stand closer. You need to stand closer. Stand closer. I like stand closer. I like your ball. Water resilience. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you. So now we are going to start section one, sustainable wastewater management. Let us invite Professor Irene Lowe to chair session one. Professor Lowe is currently the chair professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the senior fellow of Hong Kong UST Jockey Club Institute for Advanced Study. Professor Lowe, please. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Irene Lowe from Hong Kong UST. And uh, today, actually, I'm uh, pretty glad uh, to see so many books from uh, the friends uh, from DSD, from WSD, EPD, and also friends from a uh, private sector consultant firm, and as well as our Hong Kong UST colleagues. All right. I'm the uh, moderator and chairman for the, uh, this, the first section on the sustainable waste management. Now, uh, in this section, uh, we have two outstanding speakers. All right, uh, one from Netherlands, one from our Hong Kong USD, and then uh, after the uh, two speech, and then we will follow by a uh, panel discussion, and uh, each speaker will be given uh, 20 minutes. I hope that you will stick to the schedule, and because we don't want to overrun. And then uh, after that, then uh, the panel uh, section, uh, we will have uh, four panel members, including the two speakers, as well as uh, two um, panel from members from the uh, Kingsford uh, company and also from the uh, DSD. And then uh, they will be given right, uh, five minutes each right, to say something about their views on the uh, sustainable uh, waste management or wastewater management. Now, when we talk about uh, sustainable uh, wastewater management, some of you might think about that in the old day, we always talk about the uh, technologies we develop to treat the wastewater to meet the uh, standard, right? That is end of pipe treatment. And then uh, nowadays, uh, many of us will believe that in the next generation, our wastewater treatment actually has to embed or put into the uh, circular economy in a way that now the uh, resources recovery energy recovery from the wastewater treatment. So it is not just to remove pollutants from the wastewater in order to meet the standard. In the future, we're looking for the technologies that can be used to treat the wastewater at the same time, hopefully reduce the energy consumption or even, uh, even recover the energy from wastewater treatment. And some paper talk about the um, the uh, waste, uh, the uh, water, and energy losses, and that's kind of papers and talk about different technologies that can be used. And recently, I find that now the the research paper talk about another advanced stuff: the uh, water, energy, and waste losses. So waste is what waste could be the solid waste, could be the waste generated from the wastewater treatment, such as sludge. Right. So how we can recover the uh, resources, right, such as the uh, phosphorus, nut nutrients, and uh, energy during the uh, treatment process. Now, uh, in these uh, sections, right, we hopefully will have some um, uh, enlightenment from our two speakers, and hopefully we can uh, discuss uh, more, not only just on technologies, might be uh, even the uh, future direction of the wastewater treatment and also the um, policy from the government side, how to all right, uh, make it worse, how to treat our wastewater and at the same time to make it a really real circular economy. All right. So uh, that is uh, uh, the starting point. And then uh, without further ado, may I invite the first speaker, uh, engineering professor, Dr. Merlo the core. I just learned how to pronounce it yesterday when I have the dinner with them. Okay, so uh, Professor Kaur, your time. Thank you so much, Professor Lo, for my uh, um, for the nice introduction. And um, I will try to. Oh, we are at the summer halfway, so I have to switch to the the first slide otherwise you already see the whole presentation eh? so 
then there's no surprise anymore. Okay, so today I uh, would like to uh, introduce you in wastewater treatment developments in the, in the Netherlands and also how we try with wastewater treatment to come to this circular economy. Uh, my name is Merle de Kreuk, I'm from TU Delft from the Department of Water Management in the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences. So if we look at, if we have economic activity, well, if I look outside, I should not be distracted too much by the beautiful view uh, <laughs> above your head. Um, but if we have econo economic activity, we have waste, and generally waste will lead to environmental problems. But actually, we could also see waste as a mixture of undefined resources. And that's also why I don't like to talk about wastewater treatment, but actually we should see our wastewater as water with resources. Um, these resources, we can get them out with biological processes. And then we can discuss if it's circularity or recovery, but it doesn't really matter, it's just in the name. So there are all kinds of considerations for uh, recovery. And I have an example of phosphate recovery that we do now a lot in the Netherlands. It, it gets pretty normal, actually. And all the water authorities would like to make a clean, natural fertilizer out of our wastewater. So recover the ammonium and the phosphate and bring it back to the, um, to the fertilizer, the artificial fertilizer industry. Um, and well, it is a really nice circular thought, but on the other hand, we also solve a problem with it. Because this phosphate in our equipment is really precipitating and clogging up our equipment. So we find struvite production in all the pipelines and in the reactors where we don't want it. So now we actually go into the recovery in the treatment plants and at the same time create a very nice product. So that is, yeah, it's too sides of the same coin, we solve a problem and also we can be more sustainable. So all the things that we could recover from a sewage treatment plant are actually in this, uh, in this slide as far as we know now. Maybe there's much more that we are not aware of yet. So if I run you through here in the um, activated sludge system, we could make bioplastics. There has been an, uh, um, a pilot in the Netherlands to do so. And depending on the technology, you could also extract alginate like exopolymers. I will tell a little bit more about that later. From the water we have, of course, the effluent, if we treat it well enough, we can get a lot of water back. The example was already mentioned. Also, energy, we can create energy, but we should also reduce energy in a whole treatment. Um, and then my own main interest at the moment is what we all can get from our sludge in the end. And sludge is so rich in nutrients and in energy that we should try to get everything out in a sludge digester. Well, and then there's a specific one, the, our toilet paper that comes in in the form of cellulose. And in the Netherlands, we use about 13 kilos of toilet paper per person per year. I don't know about Hong Kong standards, but it might be more or less the same. Um, so this cellulose, we can recover and turn into paper again, but a pizza box from used toilet paper is perceived not too well. Um, <laughs> So what we could do with it is turn it into volatile fatty acids and these volatile fatty acids we can turn into bioplastics again. So there we could also take a resource out and use it as a resource to make another uh, product. Well, and as I said, I focus mainly on these digester systems. On the other hand, I would like to first start with one of my, I always mention it as my first child before I became a mother, um, the aerobic granular sludge system, which is actually uh, addressing this exopolymer production, water production and reduction of energy use. So the aerobic granular sludge technology, I started to work on it in um, 2000 and was able to uh, work on the development until the first full-scale installation when I 
shifted topic, but still I have some projects in the field. Um, I would like to show you The Hague, the city where I come from in the Netherlands, looks very different as, uh, than Hong Kong, but still we have quite a few uh, people living there. And we have a sewage treatment plant that's recently built, it's called Sewage Treatment Plant Harnos Polders, a very nice name abroad. Um, but before the sewage treatment plant was somewhere in the city and there was no place for expanding, so it was decided to move the whole treatment plant outside, build a whole new treatment plant. and then kind of conventional, so it was occupying a lot of space that we also can use somewhere else. And then um, my promoter, you might know him, Professor Mark van Loostrecht, he's also very active here. Um, he thought, well, we could, we keep growing this bacteria in flocculated structures in uh, sewage treatments, wouldn't it be so much nicer to grow them in granules? Uh, because granules will settle mast faster and then we can get rid of all these clarifiers. So that's actually the idea he had and the first reactor was there when I started working and then we brought it to a new technology. And how does this work, making this aerobic granular sludge that looks, why, how can we get the bacteria to leave their nice flocculated environment where they have always enough oxygen and food and kind of force them to, to grow in these aggregates. So that was the challenge that we had to, to figure that out, how we could do that and in a stable way and that it also could stay like that. So actually there are a couple of tricks. Um, what we managed to do is with biotechnology, select the right organisms and then the organisms that can have the initial uptake of the BOD into their cells um, during feeding. So that's one of the things that we do. And then during aeration, we let these cells grow on their internally stored substrate. So on their cell fat, as I always say to the students. Um, and then every cycle there is a uh, selection applied to all sludge to keep the granules, so every organism that's sticking to their aggregate, they can stay in this nice system with plenty of food that we call wastewater treatment. And all the granules that misbehave and grow in flocks, we kick out. So that selection also helps to maintain these granules in the, in the system. So there we transform the biomass structure. And then hydraulics comes in as well because that is this selective wasti wasting of the slower settling biomass. And um, so that's the way that the sludge is wasted that we kick out. So it's a combination of biotech and hydraulics in this system. Well, how does it work then in the end from a scientific point of view? Is that there is an oxygen gradient over the granule uh, during aeration. So the food is like stored everywhere, but the oxygen concentration is maintained a little bit low and it is consumed in the outer layer. So we have an aerobic zo zone in these granules on the outside and then in the middle it is anaerobic, but there's no oxygen because it cannot reach the core of these granules. Then during feeding, as I said, we had BOD storage in the cells of the organisms. So the whole granule is fat, they all have enough food. So in the outside, they can use their food with oxygen and in, in, in the inside, they don't have oxygen. But in the outside, there's nitrification going on. So the ammonium is nitrified to nitrate and the nitrate can enter the center of this granule. So in the center of the granule with the stored food, we can have the nitrate reduction to the nitrogen gas. And in the same time, since we make use of phosphate accumulating organisms, there's phosphate removal going on. So actually for the wastewater treaters here in the audience, what we do in all the different tanks in a, a normal UCT or biochemical phosphate removal system, we do here in one granule. And that was kind of a breakthrough. So, oh, it stopped. Oh, yes. So, and we have slow growing organisms at the same time because we work with this phosphate accumulating organisms. So, um, yeah, they also like to sit nicely together. They don't, ha they don't have the, the um, velocity to go out of this granule and, and escape and grow in weird filaments. So we have heterotrophic phosphate accumulating organisms on the inside that denitrify and we have ammonium oxidizers on the outside of the granule and this is actually 
a picture that um, I took long time ago where you could see that these, um, these uh, ammonium oxidizers are on the outside and these heterotrophics are through the whole granule. Well, then that is done in practice and this is a typical um, view of a cycle that you would could, uh, could see uh, come across if you operate such a sequencing batch reactor. So you have a, a feeding period and then you switch on the aeration and you see an enormous peak of ammonium because that was all fed to the system and a phosphate because it was all released from the organisms. And then during the aeration phase that is nicely taken up and here you see that there's a little bit of nitrate produced but way less than the ammonium that's consumed. So that is the simultaneous nitrification, denitrification that's going on in these granules. And then there's a denitrification phase and then everything nicely goes to very low um, concentrations that reach the effluent uh, standards. So this, since 2012, this is the first uh, full-scale installation was then built in the Netherlands, in APA. And uh, then it was also called Nereda, so maybe you know this granular sludge under this uh, brand name. And it saves space since it has a small footprint because you don't need all these final clarifier. Then it also saves building materials, a lot of concrete because you don't need to build these structures. Um, it saves energy because of we don't need to pump around all this sludge and everything happens in the same uh, reactor. Um, and it produces biopolymers, and that is one nice thing that can be recovered from this sludge. It is now uh, produced under the brand name Calmera, but it's actually a kind of alginate-like structure, a polymer that you can use in all kinds of applications. And since 2012, there are over 60 uh, of these reactors built. And that is really nice if you work on a PhD and in the end you really see it in practice. And there is actually a pilot now, so I was here in Hong Kong and then I saw this technology also tried here in Hong Kong, which made me feel really proud. It's really nice. Um, so this is um, this uh, Nareda system. You can see this is in the north of the Netherlands. And this um, installation is treating half of the sewage uh, coming in and this whole installation is treating the other half. So there you can see that it's really compact. And also this one saves, uh, uses about 50 to 60% less energy and the effluent standards are pretty nice. So for this treatment plant in Harness Porter, we don't need the final clarifiers anymore. This granular sludge concentration in the reactors are higher than we can reach with activated sludge. So we we use also less space for the biological tanks. We don't need pretreatment. It can all be just fed to these reactors. So in the end, it uses 75% less area. And yeah, unfortunately for this treatment plant in Harness Porter, it was too late, but maybe here in the Chatin wastewater treatment plant. We will have to see how the pilots uh, are going here. So that is one part of the story I wanted to tell you. The other part is like my new hobby, uh, anaerobic digestion. And in anaerobic digestion, I mainly focus on biogas production, but that could be as well volatile fatty acids. It just depends on where you stop the whole uh, degradation process of your sludge. So anaerobic digestion of, of waste sludge. And to get one of the aims in the Netherlands is to create less sludge because the sludge needs to be incinerated and incineration is pretty uh, in, uh, technology intensive and expensive. So we want to have as little sludge as possible. But actually in um, water treatment system, if you have the biological treatment, that is not really possible because with the COD that you put in, uh, you will create about six grams per liter of sludge uh, per person today. Might be different if you have the saline water, like here in uh, a bit more saline water as in Hong Kong, then you might be a bit lower than that. But this is for all the other biological systems that are on uh, like low salinity, the sludge that you would produce. Um, this sludge consists of living bacteria, but that's actually only a very small fraction, 10 to 15% of the organisms are in there. And then there's a whole lot of other junk in it. Um, it can be higher organisms like worms and protozoa, 
Uh, it's partly carbohydrates and proteins that in, are in the extracellular polymeric structures. There's lipids. Of course, there's DNA, RNA also around from the organisms that died. There's a lot of humic matter in it. And there's these kind of stuff that come from the wastewater and is incorporated immediately in the flock. So that is fibers, it can be cellulose, it can be plant materials, cell fractions, clay, precipitates, some sandy, silty fractions, heavy metal, hair. There's a lot of hair in sludge, which really frustrates my PhD students who have to work with real sludge because they have to get it out. It's a dirty job. Um, but there is also organic micro pollutants in it. So that is done very well. We want to take it out of the wastewater and it ends up in our sludge. And plastic. There's a lot of microplastics in sludge from synthetic clothing, from scrubbing material, from um, tire runoff in the Netherlands we don't have separate sewers so the the runoff from the streets end up and it all ends up in the sludge well to be able to get less sludge in the end and better dewaterable sludge we could uh, digest the sludge so if we want to get the sludge production down we should get the sludge conversion up and luckily, then also the biogas production program of sludge will increase. And that's what we like eh, in this circular economy. Um, if we get the conversion up, also we reduce the amount of, organ of our organics in the sludge. And then we will get our dewaterability up, which is then less volume of sludge in the end. Uh, which leads to lower processes co process costs and also lower energy need for the final incineration. Actually, this whole degradation of sludge starts with hydrolysis, and that's where my real research interest comes in. I want to understand how these, these big structures, these big molecules in sludge are hydrolyzed and cracked to be able for the next steps in digestion to be converted. So hydrolysis is actually breaking up large molecules with enzymes into smaller molecules that are easily further degraded into volatile fatty acids or biogas. And this can be enhanced by pretreatment of sludge, like the Combi system or other type of pretreatment, increased mixing in the digesters, and a different reactor design. So we're also studying plug flow digestion. So this is my current research focus but I'm not going to speak about it now. So if you want to make know more, then you can ask me later. Because I would like to go back to this granular sludge. Oh, not back to there, back to the granular sludge. Because what we recently discovered is that the waste granular sludge in the Netherlands, so without pretreatment, without pre-settling of the wastewater, so just with after sand and fat removal, we feed all the water to the to the Nareda systems in full scale. Then we, our waste sludge looks like this. So this is the small granules and the flocks that we want to kick out, but also a lot of fibers and other suspended material. And then the aerobic granular sludge from the reactor looks like this. So you have the big granules, and then you have this material that we actually don't want like that much in between, and we remove that every cycle. And these are the washed granules. So this is actually what we call aerobic granular sludge. Keep this picture in mind, please. So what we did is, since I'm interested in digestion, we said, we said, okay, let's digest these different fractions of sludge. That might be interesting, and actually it is. Um, and we checked the composition of the different sludges, and we could see that the waste granular sludge, so the big granules, and waste activated sludge are pretty much the same in composition, only the granules had a bit more lignin-like structures, uh, but the rest of the composition was more or less uh, similar. We did that with the Van Soest method for people who uh, know it. Um, and then we digested it and then we were really surprised because if we look then to the methane production throughout digestion, we can see that the waste aerobic granular sludge is actually pretty stable. St uh, stable so the granules don't produce so much methane anymore. And we think that is because these granules are for a long, long time in the reactor. So the inside of the granules, everything is eaten that can be eaten there. So it is uh, that is stabilizing the granules as they are in the reactor. This is waste activated sludge as we all know it. But then the 
the waste aerobic granular sludge, so the fluffy material that we wash out of the cycle every, uh, every cycle, is actually pretty close to the primary sludge that we take out with primary selectors. So therefore, we can see that this, um, this highly nutritious material uh, that we call primary sludge ends up in this flocculated fraction. And since it's washed out like every two cycles, it's not long enough in the Nareda reactor to be oxidized. So when we take it out, we can still digest it and come to a very high uh, biogas production, which is very nice if you look into the recovery, resource recovery. Well, and then we have cellulose, which is our uh, standard just to check if the experiment is really uh, reliable. <coughs> so our control. Well, thinking of that, we, we started to look a little bit more. Why are these granules so resilient to digestion? That was actually the next question. Um, and then we look to the granule size and we could see that in the size distribution, this is activated sludge and this is granular sludge. And the activated sludge is falling apart during digestion, that's something we know. So the particle size is decreasing. And then in granular sludge we also saw it, but still there was quite a large percentage of big granules that remain after 44 days of anaerobic digestion. So these granules are stronger. And we were thinking, what can that be? And we came to the conclusion that that is the structural EPS that is, uh, um, uh, that is holding this granule together, that that decreases slower in aerobic granular sludge than in waste, granular slu uh, waste activated sludge. And you could also see that from the proteins and the polysaccharide decrease during degradation. So then I come to some concluding remarks of all this research and experience. And the first one is that the aerobic granular sludge technology, yeah, this is what I said, eh, it reduces energy, building material. And actually the effluent is even very good as uh, to uh, recycle and reuse in the end. You could use membranes to for the last filtration step and some tests also show that these membranes they can be, um, they hold very long. Um, this primary sludge that you feed to an ends in ends up in the flocculated fraction of the waste granular sludge, so not affecting the processes, but could lead to high biogas recovery. And this um, structural EPS is a biopolymer that's not easy to degrade, but it gives structure to the granules. And that can be recovered as a, as a product before or after anaerobic digestion. And my research now continues on this structural EPS to see how we can crack it and make it biodegradable as well. Because at the places where you don't want to recover it, it would be nice to be able to make biogas or fatty acids out of it. But actually my final concluding remark is that it doesn't really matter if a new technology is invented or research is done um, to solve a problem like footprints, that you want to reduce footprint or that you want to increase biodegradation or that you want to create struvite. Because from all these new innovations in the end, the circularity could benefit. So I would like to thank my team of PhD and postdoc researchers who actually make this all possible because otherwise I would not I could not have told you this new research. And um, I was requested by the uh, embassy to show our uh, online uh, courses of the TU Delft, but they are actually pretty nice. And I'm working now one on, on one on aerobic granular sludge as well that will be released in January 2020, so I still have some work to do. Um, and there is also an IWA World Conference that I'm organizing on anaerobic digestion, and that is um, from 23 to 27 of June in Delft in the Netherlands. So if you want to come to the spacious and green and quiet Delft, you're welcomely invited to register, of course. <laughs> so thank you for the attention.
All right, thank you all right, for the uh, excellent talk. And then uh, we know more about this uh, AGS technologies, uh, compact small footprint, trip, and uh, yeah, energy, right, and then resources recovery. Later on, we can talk more resilience. about uh, this technology and also the pilot uh, study in Hong Kong uh, is, uh, in Sha Tin or the full scale mm -hmm. right, in uh, Lava Land. And then the second speaker uh, um, is our uh, UST professor, Joseph Lee. And I believe that uh, most of you yeah, right, know okay. him very well. When I talk to some of you and say that, I don't want okay. to say something because uh, Professor Joseph Lee was my uh, former teacher and I don't uh, want to talk too much. <laughs> okay, so uh, just uh, highlight some of the things about uh, Professor Joseph Lee. And uh, he uh, was our former right, vice uh, president and also the, in Hong Kong UST and also the former vice chancellor uh, and vice president in Hong Kong U. And uh, he okay. is currently our chair professor in our department and also the uh, past vice president okay. right, in the, uh, uh, as, a chair, uh, as the chief editor of the Journal of the Hydro Environment Research. I don't want to say too yeah. much because uh, no, nobody say that in, uh, knows uh, Joseph Lee well. And then I'm giving him more time to talk about his uh, uh, research on the disinfections. Okay, okay. All right, so okay, let's uh, welcome you. Professor uh, Lee. Thank you, Irene. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so uh, what I'd like to talk about today is something we've struggled with uh, over the past five years or so, uh, jointly with the government. And uh, it's a bit remote from the circular economy, but, but certainly, certainly it reduces energy. Uh, it reduces uncertainty and it enhances sustainability. So what, what I'd like to talk about is actually a, a problem in Hong Kong, uh, which has something to do with the harbor area treatment scheme and with disinfection. And, and one, one message I'd like to introduce is the, the, the need for interdisciplinarity. And this problem took us five years to crack, and, and it can't be done alone with just chemistry. Uh, or we just flew mechanics. You need you need both. And and you know I I'll, I'll go over the details very quickly. But we need to get, give an idea of the essence of it. Uh, uh, why why is it is important and, and what what really is the difficulty? So I mean to protect our beaches. You know we we uh, some of you would know we go through. I'm sure it's been introduced this harbor area treatment scheme, enhanced uh, advanced primary treatment. Uh, well, we need disinfection after the treatment to protect our beaches, uh, for sure. Uh, we have a cluster of beaches very, very close, about 10 kilometers away from the, the point of discharge of the harbor area treatment scheme. Uh, but we also have this annual cross-harbor swimming race, which is very important to Hong Kong. It's a, kind of a symbol of our harbor. And uh, it was, by the way, it was discontinued for 30 years until very recently. Uh, because of this infection, we are disinfecting. We are we are achieving sustainability. So, so what is the? Uh, let me just see if this is uh, okay. So, so I'm sure it has been introduced. We we uh, centrally collect the the sewage in nose about 100 meter below ground to this stone cutter island sewage treatment works, where where the sewage. Uh, receives chemically enhanced primary treatment, CPT treated sewage, uh, with a network of tunnels. And so currently, uh, 3 million population of sewage, 2 million cubic meter per day of sewage uh, is treated centrally in this Stone Cutters Island uh, sewage treatment works. And after treatment, it, 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 well, it's disinfected, and then it's, it's discharged directly into a harbor with hundreds of these buoyant jets, uh, which uh, through a uh, 1.2 kilometer long uh, outfall diffuser. Now, the issue is something like this. Well, we want to protect our beaches, so uh, the usual water quality standard is uh, on a beach. Uh, it has to be less than 180 units, so 180 uh, E. coli counts per 100 milliliter this concentration, and and. You really would, and Hong Kong takes EIA very, very seriously. So that means you really, I mean, government departments is uh, very afraid of EVD, you know, who checks on them. So you really have to follow this, okay. Now, so, so that means uh, 
you have to bring the, the, the concentration of E. coli, as you know, treatment doesn't quite remove bacteria, all the way from 10 to the 7 units down to about 10,000 or 100,000. So you have to, through this infection, through this is you know, two orders of magnitude, and then let, let nature take care of itself. Now, uh, we don't enjoy the privilege of a lot of space, as you know. So the sewage treatment works for a population of 3 million is all congested on this stonecutters island. As you can see, these are sedimentation tanks. After, after this, uh, you know, this is 2 million cubic meter per day. This is the largest treatment works of its kind in the world. So you can think of it as 25 cubic meter per second. That's like the river flow, a flow of a river, Shenzhen River, that's about, you know. So you can think of uh, treating the sewage with advanced primary treatment, then it goes through a, so the chlorine is kind of dosed, we are dosing 10% sodium hypochloride solution. And this is the first time this infection is done this way in the world, so really there's no prior experience to, to base on. And so the idea is you, you already you dose it, uh, this 10% uh, sodium hypochloride solutions, 300 tons per day, into the treated sewage. And the idea originally is that hopefully after this passage through this one kilometer long uh, conduit, uh, you allow for about 10 minutes of uh, contact time. This is what you get in a textbook. 10 minutes of contact time, and then it will be disinfected. But it, it's nothing, well, you know, uh, the operation experience is, is nothing like this. So, so, so that's why we got into it. There's a lot of uh, chlorine consumption that is very mysterious and, and which prompts this research. So let me make a few statements uh, initially. First, Chlorine disinfection is really essential to protect our harbor, beaches, recreation activities, whatnot. Now, it turns out that what happens in this very, very large scale street treatment process, two million cubic meter, two million tons per day, very, very large scale process. What happens there, actually the essence of it happens within one meter, within one meter of the dosage point. And it took us a long time to understand why because you have to marry the chemistry with the fluid mechanics. And, and, and the, the idea is this chlorine disappears due to fast, very fast chemical reactions of 0.1 second. One, I mean, of the order of one second. And uh, so the question is, well, is it true? Because it is very uh, complicated to take measurements in the field and so on. And exactly what do you do to ensure this sustainable operation? Now, why is it important? Well, think of 300 tons per day. We have six this, of all these holding tanks, two of these day tanks, and we have to import it from mainland China. When there's a vacation, you don't get as much as you want, you know, spring. When there are very tight control on chemicals, you don't get as much as you want. So the idea is really, we really would like to optimize this dosage, uh, coin dosage, to have uh, more sustainability of our operations, and certainly it reduces uh, uh, energy and consumption. And uh, because you think of every day, you see so many trucks trucking in this chlorine, I mean, 300 tons per day. And not to mention, uh, you know, if you add too much of chlorine, it's harmful to the environment. So, so you need the certainty or the understanding of the operation. And, and in this case, it's not so much too much chlorine it is, uh, you know, too much of it is consumed. So the way it is operated in the plant is something as follows. You think of a river of sewage, 20 cubic meter per second, and it goes through two kind of culverts coming in, and then you inject this 10 percent chlorine solution in the form of an array. You know, uh, this is about uh, 48 uh, dense chlorine jets. It so happens. Chlorine solution is denser than the environment, specific gravity 1.2. So the question is, this is uh, one, you know, you so we inject this as dense jets. So uh, the idea, of course, it, it will mix, it will undergo chemical reaction. And so it, it, this, the observation is that a lot of chlorine, so this is the mixing chamber, but the observation is 
a lot of the chlorine is already lost at the exit of this chamber. Not, so really, you're not making use of this contact tank, and nobody really knows what's happening at the beginning. And in fact, this is just, uh, this is just to, to indicate, to drive home the point. On the left is uh, the applied dosage. You know, in the summer, we have to apply as much as like 20 milligram per liter of chlorine dosage. And over most of the time at the exit, you don't see anything. So that means most of the time it's gone. So why is it gone? The question is, what was happening? And this, this prompted a lot of, uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, in the winter also, you see very, very little chlorine. So basically that means the chlorine is used to, con to, con to be used, consumed by the organics rather than doing the pathogen kill. Okay, this is the idea. Now, it took us a long time to understand this, but to, to understand the fact that, you know, most of these tests are done in beaker tests, in, uh, you know, in a beaker. You, you just mix it a bit and then you... But the point is, mixing the beaker is very different from chlorine dosing in a field operation because let's say you want a 10 milligram per liter fully mixed concentration of chlorine. Now, the source, 10% so hypochlorite concentration is 100,000 milligram per liter, 100,000. So it will decrease it by 10,000 times. Now normally in a beaker, it's easy to do. You take 0.1 milliliter of this concentrated, you mix it into one liter. You mix, so the mixing is instantaneous. The, the reactant is limited. You get some results, you say, wow, this is okay, then that's okay. And then you, you base all the conclusion on this. It turns out this doesn't quite work in this case because in the field, actually, you have a large flow of continuous supply of reactants, and also you need a finite distance before you can actually, uh, you know, you, you think of mixing a river. How do you actually mix a river with chlorine? I mean, it's a very, very uh, challenging problem. So what, what we've done is, uh, what we actually end up doing is, uh, we build a model, full-scale model. One to two is pretty much full-scale at the treatment plant because there's no way you can model this sewage and so on. So we do tests with prototype sewage and prototype chlorine and the idea is we, we cut a slight, a, a kind of a 1 16 slice of this, uh, uh, what's happening in the treatment plant and we build, we, do a, we build a model. We spend half a million in Dongguan to build this. Nobody in Hong Kong wants to build it <laughs> because it, you know, it's, it's kind of, so we had to, go to, uh, and there's a lot of work to actually design this and so on. So basically, we are doing few experiments in a controlled manner because think of all the complications that can happen in an actual sewage treatment plant. So we actually uh, 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 model this with, uh, with um, you know, real sewage, real 10% chlorine. And as you can see, this, is, this setup is actually quite a, quite a sizable setup. And uh, so, so, you know, so what happens? You know, you think of you dosing, let's say, two out of the 48 of these, uh, these dense jets. So what's happening? So what's happening is you dose this dense chlorine jet into the river of sewage. Then you get a, a series of what we call advector line thermals forming, these vortex pairs, which can effectively dilute this to uh, 100 times within a very, very short distance. So that what it means is, uh, so anyway, you see these voltages coming out. Now, this is not sewage, this is sugar solution. I mean, we are, we are simulating very expensive, you know. <laughs> but, but of course, if you will sewage, you can see this. So, but the point is, unless you get, because as I said, uh, things happen really within that one meter. And unless you are very confident of what happens with the turbulence in that one meter, there's no way to talk about chemical reactions. So, and that's why we, we invest a lot of uh, resources, time, et cetera, to do this. Uh, now, so anyway, I don't want to go into details, but basically we, we know uh, pretty much uh, how the mixing goes with these advector line thermals. Uh, with, uh, we have a good hold on this boundary layer phenomenon. And the idea is we somehow need to build in the chlorine kinetics into this in a, in a valid way. And it took us a, so I won't go into details, but basically we have a way of simulating the, the kind of degree of mixing, how the chlorine goes and so on. But to simulate the chlorine, you need to understand the kinetics. And the kinetics is something like this. So if you, if you this is the chlorine to ammonia nitrogen ratio. So you think of, 
if the chlorine concentration is very high, uh, so this is like uh, the chlorine concentration you measure. This is the chlorine to ammonia nitrogen ratio by weight. So when it's around 7.6, what happens is this break point, when it exceeds this break point chlorination, then very quickly chlorine will react with the organics with ammonia to form nitrogen gas and you, you lose everything. If you are below 5 to 7.6, it will change to chloroamine and it will still retain its oxidation power, its disinfection power. In fact, I should also mention this work is carried out with the late Professor Hao Wang. We, we did a lot of work uh, together on this. So we, we have experiments to prove this uh, ratio of 7.6. If, if it's purely oxidation of ammonia, yeah, so the idea is you want to operate below the breakpoint chlorination if you want to consume less chlorine. So that, anyway, this is just the idea. Now, what's more is beyond this kind of breakpoint chlorination, what we found is when you have high concentration of chlorine, you can also oxidize the organic particles so that the chlorine demand is two to three times higher at high chlorine concentration. So that means initially it's this 7.6 value, but if you use high, very high concentration, like 10%, 5%, then it can actually go up high. And you can see this very clearly. If you use, let's say, 10,000 milligram per liter, all the particles are gone. You very quickly oxidize all the particles. So we, we, anyway, we, we have very detailed laboratory experiments, field experiments to prove this point. And in fact, to prove the jet structure of the chlorine, which I won't go into. But then, then of course, you see, ultimately you have to use some kind of uh, 3D models once you understand the phenomenon. But the, the, the essence of it still is what happens in the one meter. And we also uh, uh, joined this uh, uh, few experiments with uh, CFD to, to get an idea of the, the coverage of this, uh, the, the degree of mixing that's achievable within this uh, flow development uh, uh, flow uh, chamber, uh, uh, flow development chamber, flow uh, mixing chamber, so to speak. So, so in other words, uh, you know, you, you can do kind of this kind of calculations. And, and the idea is, what we found is, the way it was discharged originally, you actually only can mix about 60 to 80 percent of, of this uh, 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 sewage flow is in contact with the chlorine. So, you know, it's not, you, you, do, you rarely achieve full mixing even within this FDC, uh, flow distribution chamber. You don't actually can, can do this. Uh, so this is one, just one point. So, and then you can all, all kinds of models to uh, uh, come up with strategies. One strategy is to use less concentration. These are the comparison with uh, a theory with experiments and so on. So I won't, I won't really go into the details, but I just want to mention the strategy we adopt finally. The strategy we adopt finally is something like this. So the idea is we want to reduce the time of exposure to high concentration, high chlorine concentration. So in other words, you, you saw this uh, very high consumption of chlorine, both due to breakpoint chlorination and also due to oxidation of the organic debris. So, and you saw the time scales. It could be from 0.1 to an order of a few seconds. So the idea is can we reduce the time of exposure to this, uh, of this uh, chlorine to these organics. Now, to have this time of, reduce the time of exposure several ways, but one easy way to, so happens in the design of the, the FDC is uh, we, we first, we can design a, a good uh, you know, distribution of jets, that's, that's one the step one we can do. But also, it took us a long time to actually figure out, we put this at the, which wasn't obvious, at the fastest point. And this unique calculation to show to convince us that really if you put it at the fastest point and the mixing is such that you can achieve a lot of reduction in the concentration to below dangerous uh, high levels uh, within a very short time, followed by uh, making use of the turbulence below this weir. Uh, there are a lot of details, but basically we're making use, uh, making use of the system to very quickly uh, decrease the concentration of this uh, from, from 100,000 to, to of the order of 1,000. 1, then then the, so this is theory. 
Uh, we prove it theory, we prove it in the, in the model you saw. And uh, very recently, in December, we actually put this in, you know, so we have a design, this is, we put it to the test in, in the field, full scale test. And so this you see, this is the, uh, I mean, you can imagine a rack of, you know, an array of these jets, uh, in fact, two rows, uh, three, three sets of it, spanning all across the river of sewage. And then you, you see this is, uh, this is uh, you know, this is just a simulation. But what you, the most important thing is this is what happens in the field amidst a very, and you see these are TRC concentration. Before it was very, very small, nearly zero. Uh, TRC, even, even at the end of the flow distribution chamber, you don't get anything. Now, all of a sudden, with this dosing, optimal dosing configuration, you get, you get TRC at very, very healthy levels. Because, uh, for, you know, this, this is, uh, I mean, the actual dosing arrangement, and so it's, it's the patterns are, are quite kind of complicated. But, but we've repeated these tests over the past few months, and we, we are, we're quite uh, confident that this can uh, save, uh, uh, you know, this chlorine demand by, uh, significantly by 15 to 20 percent at least. So, uh, you know, so I just want to uh, uh, say that uh, this is a kind of an interdisciplinary problem. And, uh, you know, it's easy to think of a bigger test. You know, you mix, uh, initially the, the studies were done using a bigger, you just mix something and you extrapolate the conclusions of the field. In this case, it seems there is some, some Somehow it doesn't work for the reasons I stated. And so even over 90%, depending on the dosage, sometimes the whole dosage is used, can be consumed within a few seconds. And most of the chlorine is used in, in the oxidation of the organic debris and ammonia nitrogen at the high concentrations and not used in bacteria. So you're, you're kind of not sustainable. And then uh, my, my, the point I want to make is the certain reduce uncertainty. Is, is a big thing because you are more, right now. I think we have more control of what what's happening, uh, so you can really s dose it very properly and then understand data a lot better. And that that is uh, not you know, took us uh, quite a bit of time. So this is uh, the final conclusion: is the full scale tests have confirmed that this uh, dosage can be optimized by by through an optimal design in high speed flow. And that took us a while to to really see and and. Uh, so, I mean, there's a whole team, and I said uh, I worked uh, uh, with the late Professor Ha Huang and, and colleagues and a lot of uh, postdocs and so on to, to make this happen because it took quite a while to get to understand because, you know, in a sewage treatment plant, a compact, congested setting, just taking data is very difficult because it's, it's toxic, it's, it's, it's not easy. So anyway, we, it was good in this case because the, the team, the whole team and the, our partner in the government believe that the model, the one in two model is worth doing. Because otherwise we cannot make any scientific conclusions. And from that, it took us a while to actually get to the, this break point to understand break point chlorination, which may be obvious to a chemist. But I think it needs that it needs that interaction because uh, it's not just chemistry. Everything happens within that one meter. So, so uh, I mean, I have uh, just one thing is that, you know, so if you do this optimal arrangement, you really, you really can, can save the, the chlorine, you know, save the chlorine demand by this much. Instead of this, you, you come up to here. So anyway, this is just some sharing. I mean, I don't have a circular economy formula to, you know, to, to, to share, but, but I just want to present the Hong Kong reality. Your reality is you, you have faced with this problem, very congested, and uh, we deal, you know, is, 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 as you can see, the, the scale of the problem is such that, that um, it, it demands some attention. And uh, so I think I'm ahead of time, actually, Irene, right? Uh, you have five uh, minutes, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> over. Over time? Over oh, I, thought I'm, I, I'm, I thought I'm ahead of time. Sorry about this. Sorry about this. You got to stop. <laughs> you had to. Yeah, sorry about this. Sorry about I, I, I don't have to. All right, okay. once again, thank you, Professor yeah. Dean. So it's time for the uh, panel discussion. Uh, basically, from two speakers, we have some ideas of uh, two different technologies. And the first one about the uh, AGS, laboratory technologies, compact, small, 
energy efficiency and also resources recovery. And the second one on the uh, disinfection, and then we know more about just uh, not just water chemistry, coordination. Actually, we have to consider the uh, mixing the fluid mechanics together. And then now we have uh, uh, the water learn from DSD, and then uh, I uh, and yeah. then also Shelley <laughs> from the uh, Kingsford Environmental. So maybe I give uh, uh, five minutes each to s let them say something about their views, either on the uh, sustainable uh, waste treatment or what you see the future direction of the uh, wastewater treatment process. Thank you, thank you, Professor Lo. Um, I think um, this uh, topic today about the sustainable wastewater treatment is quite right to me uh, because I'm, I'm from the sewage projects division. Right now I have um, three projects in, in the pipeline so it's, uh, to upgrading the existing, the existing uh, wastewater treatment plant um, by doubling the treatment capacity and also upgrading the uh, treatment standard. But the challenge is to to make it happen within the same footprint. So, so in the past few years, that, that has drive us to uh, try to look for some compact technologies, and particularly like AGS and also MBBR and, and the other SANI, also a local, a local technology. We have been um, testing it for a number of, uh, for, for over two years, and then um, the, the results are quite positive to us. And, I think um, uh, we are looking forward to to implement uh, to to adopt some of these technologies in our in these projects. So um, so the compact technology that is uh, one of our you know key objective for, for on these projects. And I think in the future, and we are looking at also recovery, uh, recovery of the resources, light. Like Biogas. Although we we are using the we have a sewage sludge and uh, in the, in our conventional uh, treatment works, and then we, we make use of them to to generate biogas. But because of the compact technologies, do require more energy. Then we have to try to minimize the the um, uh, or to make it the more energy efficient. We are we are looking forward to uh, you know to co digestion with the food waste to recover more biogas for the use of the waste treatment works. And also, uh, we are looking from the material side, we are looking for the recovery of the force waste. So, and also to, to reduce the discharge of these uh, force waste into the receiving water. Um, and basically, these are, are the technical challenges that we are, we are having. And also, uh, another dimension is, uh, you know, the, uh, this all, all these uh, wastewater treatment facilities, they are not welcomed by the community. The mo nobody wants to live next to them, <laughs> okay? But our challenge is to, um, to um, make it a more uh, environmental friendly or community friendly. Try to make it, uh, 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 we, are, we, are, we are trying to make it uh, beautify it and then uh, to uh, co-use with the public. Just like uh, open part of it for, uh, I will not say uh, it's, it's not a, a park, but at least an open space for the community to enjoy. <laughs> All right, thank you, Walter. And then Asheri, would you want to say something? Okay, um, thank you for having us here today. Um, the presentations were very, very interesting. Um, for me, listening to the presentations, I think this really um, brings up the importance of collaboration between university and researchers and industry. Um, it was quite apparent that the cost of what you're doing is very high. This is not something that's usually um, done by um, companies who are trying to survive. Um, companies will try to deliver what the... Um, the government or the community is looking for, but we don't have the resources to do the sort of research that you have done. Um, on the chlorination side, uh, I thought that's fascinating. Bringing up um, modelling. I think that the use of modelling to fine tune our processes, um, to fine tune what we do to result in savings um, for chemical consumption or to make processes more compact is really one of the um, key directions that we see at the moment. 
Um, we also see there's, um, there's actually many good technologies now, or quite a few good, well-established technologies that perform very well. And what we see, the direction is to fine-tune these, to understand the process um, in a lot of detail, and to use instrumentation so we can monitor the process very closely and then um, make it smaller because we're no longer having to design with safety factors because we know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, along with that comes the advances in instrumentation, um, which also lead that. So we have a lot of um, fairly recent technological advances which give us a lot more capacity to treat. Um, building on what Walter just said is, I think, the community buy-in. Um, that waste wa water is no longer a right, it's actually a privilege um, that we have water um, and can use it. I live in the Philippines, um, in Manila. At the moment, we don't have water. Um, I'm in a very central Manila location and we only have a couple of hours water a day because the infrastructure um, has not been able to keep up with the demand. Um, so where water is a responsibility, that means we start with educating our entire community about their water consumption and cutting down on that and what do we really need to use. Um, also educating people and industry, and some of this may be um, legislative, um, on what they put into their wastewater. Because my company is end of pipe, so we have to treat what you give us. Uh, but if we get given wastewater that is toxic, our biological systems can't work. So there we have to consider how our waste is um, generated. So I think the future is, is buy-in of the community, um, it's instrumentation, it's collaboration between researchers and industry, which has to come with government support. Um, I think Hong Kong is a very... Um, impressive in how much the government has invested in research and development in wastewater. I mean, my company has been involved in wastewater research and development with the Hong Kong government for 20 years now. Um, so uh, we really appreciate that, and I think that gives you a lot of advantages. All right. So uh, thank you, Sally. I think uh, one, one good point is that now uh, for the uh, circular economy, for the wastewater treatment. Actually, we look at different aspects. You know, those are speakers also point out. Technology itself. Now we have uh, nowadays uh, the, uh, some advanced technologies that we can consider right, to use. Those technologies developed by the, uh, maybe the, uh, uh, the institutions. And we have to collaborate with the government to see whether those uh, uh, new technologies work in our local environments. And the other is instrumentations, right? It's another challenges issue. The third one I can uh, consider is that you know, policy, right? The uh, legislation, whether the uh, government in, you know, in Hong Kong or some other parties or uh, other countries, the policy making could be the key drivers to make right, the, uh, this kind of uh, new concepts, treatment with the circular economies uh, possible, all right? And uh, maybe we, we can uh, talk something, uh, not only just always focus on technology itself, so we can broaden uh, the will to cover the policy instrumentation and also technologies. And uh, maybe uh, we give the time, all right, to, to the floor to see whether there's a questions you want to ask our speakers and also panel members. Yes. Hello, I have a question on AGS, Professor Dekra. Um, what, what would you say about the next breakthrough in AGS? Would it be in like uh, with the Animox or with the Quick Startup, something like this? Okay, and thank you for the question. Um, the, um, I'm not sure about the breakthrough in aerobic render sludge at the moment because now all these new wastewater treatment plants are being established and really a lot of them are, are being created now and we learn now so much from what we see in practice that we are now um, 
on a level in science of observing what is going on and then try to explain it what is going on. A combination with Anamox could be really nice for uh, wastewater in industry where you have where you have your C N ratio uh, low, so a lot of N, a little bit of C. Um, that is something that has been tested already in the in the lab and have been some publications about. I don't think that is in practice yet. I look at my right side. The the Anamox and the N Rada combination uh, in practice. I haven't seen it, n no neither, but is, I just want to... Given that your, um, Nare given that your Nareda sludge already has its own structure, that's almost similar to having its own carrier, which is um, happening um, internally by itself without having to use an external carrier. Mm -hmm. So um, it may, maybe they're, they're completely different technologies. No, that, uh, but I disagree on that because yeah. it has been done in the lab where you have the, because the inside of the granule is actually very nice for Anamox because oh. you, if you can, are able to in the outside uh, make sure that your ammonium is only nitrified till nitrite and that can diffuse inside and also with some ammonium and that you, and then you get the Anamox process in the inside with the ammonium and the nitrite. So it can be done, but yeah, then it's the, the circumstances have to be right to do so. And I'm not sure if that is already uh, in industry. Um, another thing that has been is tried now in the Netherlands is the combination of um, um, powdered activated carbon dosage and radar to be able to remove more pharmaceuticals. But that will be done in the near future, so we will see how that ends up. It could be that all the powdered activated carbon is like in the flocculated part and will be washed out within six hours. Then it doesn't work, but if it starts to also attach to the granules and stay in the reactor a long time, that could be a good thing to happen in the removal, the additional removal of pharmaceuticals. But those are things that are looked at at the moment. Um, yeah, not in practice yet. So we are still continuing. All right. Uh, might be. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, Otto. Thank you. Uh, I would like to address a question to the lady professor from Netherlands. I ha cannot spell your name. Forgive me, please. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> uh, Hong Kong government spend a lot of money to support the universities in R and Ds in all fields, particularly in environment and engineering and technology. Uh, but we apparently cannot get so much research results pass through the industry to commercialize those, those, uh, those results. Now, you, in your presentation, you mentioned you had applied your process in about 50 different plants in Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And how can you share your experience? How, do you, how can you be so successful in, in, your, in your, uh, uh, te giving your technology to the industry? Well, it is a, a big uh, dose of luck, I think, and working, having the luck to work on a technology the act that actually works. And I think that is the, the beauty of science, where it's different from uh, industry, that in science we try to understand things that we observe. So, and we try from this understanding, once in a while there's a technology that you think, oh, now I understand, and hey, we could also make a technology out of it. Um, and then it, I think it's crucial in an early stage to team up with industry. And that is what, is hap what happened in this Nareda example, that when I was performing my PhD, uh, already in the second year, I, we teamed up with uh, the company Haskoning DHV. And the engineers at Haskoning DHV, they were looking at the full-scale application while I was in a lab like running around with my Erlenmeyer, uh, my, my small uh, flask and trying to get get the understanding of why these bugs grow in granules. And I came up with all kinds of things that they needed. And then I went to discuss with my engineer uh, colleagues at the in, in, at, in industry at Haskell and DHV. And they said, yeah, come on, we cannot do this in practice. Come up with a new idea. And then I went back in the lab and then with this new boundary condition, see if it would work then as well. And this continuous collaboration with industry and university and then the support, the support we got from the water authorities to test it and pilot it and um, 
yeah, they were spending also quite some money on it to to be able in an in a kind of um, safe environment to test what we uh, what we are doing. I think that was crucial for this technology, and that is something that is also done a lot in the Netherlands. So in a lot of the funding uh, projects, we have the uh, the scientific, the research institute or university, the industry and the government supporting all this. Okay. Maybe Professor Lee, you want to say something about you know, the wheels? Yes, you know, because you also work with the governments for different projects and also your, how to con the, the, uh, your research and then uh, work with the government in a way that it, you know, make it more meaningful. Uh, well, I thought right now it's pretty meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, 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 yeah, no, I, I think that there's, uh, as Otto suggests, I think there's room for, for, uh, for a bit of change in, in attitude on both sides, on the, from the university side, you know, academics just like writing papers. Which mm -hmm. is, I think the thing is not recognized. It's actually work on these projects. You write high impact papers, but you have to wait longer. 10 years later, but most uh, academics may not want to wait yeah, 10 years or something. But, but uh, as your uh, work is very high impact, right? It's, it seems, uh, you know. So, um, so I think it, it, the, the, I would say the momentum is changing in Hong Kong. I mean, the government is uh, investing a lot of R&D and we're going to double our funding as well. And we encourage international collaboration. I think we welcome ideas and, and, and the universities are all geared up to, to uh, in this direction. So I think this event is a very uh, welcome initiative by Institute for the Environment, you know, to uh, uh, to kind of uh, even encourage this further <laughs> and to uh, enable people to network. I mean, certainly the next topic would be even more exciting. I mean, this, uh, you know, <laughs> the second session. But I'd like to can I ask one question? You know, if to. Uh, uh, professor, lady professor next to me. So, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, you know, it seems, I mean, I, so just wow, I mean, it seems very compact, you know, this a, a granular, of course, you know, in anaerobic digestion, this granular technology has been around for a long time. Uh, so, can you imagine, let's say, what we described, this advanced primary treatment, uh, the whole treatment plant being replaced by AGS? What is the trade off? Is there any trade off? See, the, the other thing, in my, my question is, the, the en on the energy side, the sludge, the, it seems there are two things. One is uh, the circular economy getting phosphate out of it. The other is energy. Now, in Hong Kong, the way I understand is all the sludges right now go to Tea Park for energy, right? It's very, very successful. I mean, all our centrally and is our kind of a showcase, I mean, this Tea Park. So what is the trade-off if I use all the sludge for energy, I mean, can you tap the phosphate and so on? I mean, right now we actually all our sludge goes to Deep Park, mm -hmm. and which is very successful uh, because there's enough critical mass to to pump. But uh, but what about resource recovery? I mean, the phosphate recovery certainly is very important. You know, um, are there any trade-offs? I mean, if you use for energy, then resource is a bit you can't do it quite the same. Or, or what is the what is the story really? The real story, you asked me the real story. Um, I would love to share it. Um, there is, well, often I get this, this question in class as well. Like, now you tell this beautiful story, what, what is the disadvantage, please tell me. Um, yeah, and then I always answer my students, yeah, come up with a disadvantage. But that is, uh, in, in, the sludge, you, the, in the sludge digestion, as I showed in the, in the graphs, um, the waste sludge is very high in energy, so there that is that is really nice, and it is also a combination of phosphate accumulating sludge together with this primary sludge. So I don't see a trade-off there, where um, in a, whereas in the digestion of the bigger granules, as I showed, um, those are a bit more difficult to uh, they are they are more stabilized. Um, I think there we should really look in more into how we can crack this this uh, EPS. Um, the thing is the majority of the sludge comes from this this more flocculated yeah, material. Yeah, sure. So that is just if you if you have a well a very big treatment plant and at a certain moment you also have to start removing the older granules, 
yeah, then you might come into granules that is more uh, or into sludge that's more stabilized where you can get less energy out of. On the other hand, that um, that polymers, especially in a high densely populated area and the big treatment plants like this, you can extract the polymers and make a product out of it again that the group of uh, Professor van Loostrecht is looking into and, and uh, developing what you can do with these polymers. And then from the residue, you could be able to uh, you could digest the residue, only the extraction goes at a different pH. Mm -hmm. So there, then we have to look into the digestion at different pH, and then you come in a difficult scientific story again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Some work remains to be done. <laughs> yeah, that is no, that's my occupation. I find new research. <laughs> Uh, our tip are basically is a sludge incineration process, turning the sludge into the uh, energy. All right? But in, uh, you know, in the future, we also know that in Hong Kong, for our wastewater treatments, we are considering right, at least doing the uh, uh, pilot scale study, I guess, in uh, Taipo, uh, using the uh, co-digestion process, the food waste and also the sludge for co-digestion and generating the uh, biogas for uh, right, energy. Right. Could you, Walter, could you tell us more about the uh, progress of this? And also, will this kind of co-digestion will be considered in our, uh, the wastewater moving to the caverns? <laughs> I think uh, because of the food waste co-digestion is handling by uh, other team in DSD, but I, I just know a little bit. Uh, I think um, they are about to start the pilot, pilot plant in Taipo, I think, um, later this year. Okay, um, and we also have some um, some plan um, in collaboration with EBD to uh, to use the, um, to to uh, build more co-digestion plants. The, the next one will be in Satin. The existing Satin treatment works. Okay, <coughs> and but um, that will come in. I think uh, in maybe in two years, something like that. Okay. Um, but for the Caven project, because in 10 years' time, uh, I think we will, uh, <coughs> we will move the existing sardine treatment works into the Cavens. Uh, due to safety reason, we cannot do any uh, digestion inside the Cavens because um, that's, that's the advice from, the, from our FSD, the five pe surface people. They, they, they don't allow us to do any digestion um, inside the Cavens because of the safety reasons. Mm -hmm. They are afraid of the biogas yeah. accumulate, mm -hmm. accumulating okay. inside the caverns and will uh, cause explosion. Mm. <coughs> so that is one of the constraints um, for moving the uh, treatment works into caverns. Uh, so we, we have to uh, just uh, dewater the sludge and then take it to tea park and for incineration. But in, uh, uh, I visited the plant in uh, Copenhagen. It is uh, underground. Uh, wastewater treatment plant. They also have the uh, anaerobic digestion generating the biogas. So that means it's not uh, unusual to have this kind of a system in there. You, 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 you're right, Professor Rowe. We, we have been trying to speak to our FSD people and they said, no, 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 no. You can't do that. No, different, different place, different standards. So. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, we have a question over there. Uh, uh, not question, but uh, supplement. I'm TK Chen from uh, the EPD. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, the uh, we, BSD and us, uh, are cooperating for the co-digestion project. Uh, I'm responsible for the uh, food waste uh, pre-treatment process, and the plant will be uh, commissioned uh, in May, mm -hmm. and uh, in the full commission, hopefully in uh, in June. So. Uh, just wait for a moment. <laughs> you will have a chance to visit it. All right. Okay, so that is uh, in the typo, right? For yeah, co-digestion. Uh, we'll, we'll only start with six tons and we'll move on to 50 tons because it's a six year pilot trial. So the 60, uh, we're talking about 50 ton trial. So the 50 tons, we're talking about trying it like in six years time, but for the commissioning of the food waste preparation plants, we are looking for like maybe six ton commissioning first, uh, commissioning the plant with the six ton um, food waste, and then later on with another six ton. And um, our EPD colleagues are thinking of um, commissioning with the 50 ton, but we're still talking uh, about a 50 ton commissioning, probably only for a day or two. But for long term, 50 ton per day of food waste, we would thinking of doing it only in like 
maybe five or six years time we when we have more data on um, food waste and sewage sludge co-digestion, okay. um, whether it will affect the, the process. All right, yeah. thank you. Now, another issue when we talk about uh, circular economy is the nutrients recovery. And then in China, when I talked to those, uh, the wastewater treatment plants, they told me that now the uh, uh, stringent, they have getting the more stringent standard for the phosphate, uh, the standard discharge to the water body. So some for new wastewater treatment plant, newly built, the uh, phosphate uh, concentration uh, requirements, right, down to 0.03 uh, milligram per liter. So then in Hong Kong, no, our, our standard is different, right? <laughs> but then uh, it is almost uh, the international trend, getting the uh, discharge standard of phosphate much lower. So in uh, with something uh, like uh, DSD, you know, talk about whether or not in the future we also have to consider phosphate recovery and also making the uh, uh, standard of the phosphate uh, down to such a low level. I think uh, we, we have one project in hand is for the Yunlong. The Yunlong, um, we call it Ephraim Polishing Pond, because uh, we, we are going to uh, rebuild it because we have to expand this uh, treatment capacity up to ultimately to uh, 150,000 cubic meters per day. So um, that plant, I think, um, based on the latest uh, requirement from EPD, we have to meet the, the discharge uh, requirement of uh, one milligram per liter per, per day. So I think that is the, 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 the first, yeah, mm -hmm. the, first, uh, the first plant that we have to meet that phosphate standard. And uh, we, 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 we are set also, Susanna. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. So I think uh, because of the, the incoming sewage, uh, I think the, the phosphate level is uh, not, too, not very high in, in general in Hong Kong. But, but we, we, are still, we, are still, we are still looking uh, um, uh, some measures to recover it because we uh, to recover the phosphate because uh, we we have a uh, uh, request uh, receive we re receiving request from uh, our colleagues in EPD to recover the phosphate for um, for make it as a fertilizer you know to right. because they have the all these uh, food waste uh, composting material they they want the phosphate to to enrich the, the, the nutrient value of this uh, composting material. All right. Mm. Yeah. So last thing is, Sally, do you want to supplement some information on the technologies to remove the phosphate? Because the time is up. And then I give you, the, see whether you want to say something on this topic. Um, I think the mostly phosphate is removed biologically in part, but where we have very strict phosphate standards, we need to combine the biological treatment also with uh, chemical, physical polishing. Um, so uh, that's what we're looking at delivering. In Philippines now we have 0.5 ammonia and one milligram phosphate, P, as our affluent standard. And no one has yet got an operating plant for those standards yet, but they're currently looking at that. So I don't know if a professor wants to add Actually, uh, I just want to say you now, uh, in, uh, in our research work, we are developing the uh, nanotechnologies that can recover and re uh, remove the phosphate down to this level. So, and uh, we are working with the WSD on this, and then uh, that is the way we collaborate uh, the government and also the institution together for the project. So, uh, because uh, we are a little bit over one, so uh, we, once again, thank you all the speakers and the panel members for outstanding uh, talks. So we have the coffee break afterwards, then we'll go to the second section. Yes. Okay, we are going to start session two on leakage challenge in building water, in building urban water resilience. Let us welcome Professor Mohammed Gidawi. Yeah. yeah. Chair Professor of Hong Kong UST's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering to chair session two. Professor Gidawi, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Can you hear me in the back there? Obviously not. Can you hear me in the back there? You don't have to come back, but can you be a bit quiet, please? 
All right, well, uh, thank you, I'm uh, Mohammed Gidawi. I told I have uh, 10 minutes to set the stage, so I'll uh, try to do that. Uh, what I will do is try to tell you what the challenges are for this water supply system, at least the way I see them, and how uh, Dr. Blocker's talk and some of my research fits in into those challenges. So that's what I'd like to uh, go through in the next uh, 10 minutes. I don't, water supply system are essentially our life support systems really, uh, so therefore it's no surprise that the US Academy of Engineers chose it as one of the greatest achievement of the 20th century. In fact, it ranked number four, okay? And uh, so the question is, how are we now, at least in today's lenses, the way we see them today, right? Because the, the way they view them is how it brought in cities, how it brought in livelihood to cities and so on. But now we tend to view these systems in a different way. I must report that not all, but most systems worldwide, if we think around the world, they are in pretty bad shape. More than 30% of their water and energy is waste. I emphasize here energy. Every time you lose water, you're losing energy. You have to treat the water, you have to pump the water. And that tends to be forgotten in the accountancy business that we are only losing water. Uh, monetarily speaking, if you like money, we are in Hong Kong, uh, the World Bank estimates about $20 billion of direct cost. That's direct, not indirect cost. Just the value of the money and the resources that goes into it. Uh, in terms of volume, that's enough to supply 150 cities like Hong Kong. Right? So if we save that, we don't really need to go run around and create new resources or dig or desalinate water so quickly. So we just need to be a bit more clever with this. Added to this, the stresses that's going to come in on this by climate change. Now, another interesting thing is what we used to think as resiliency turns out maybe not so resilient. And I think Dr. Blocker will tell us more about that. The, lots of our designs in the old days for this water supply system are governed by fire flows. Fire needs a lot of diameter. You need to make the pipe so big to fight fires. Fires don't happen that quick, that often, but when they happen, you need to be ready. But what it means with big pipes, the speed is very small, and that means depositions. So what is turning out is you end up with pipes like this, and you end up with uh, health issues. In the US, there was a paper that estimates about 20% of water quality issues come in from such issues. So do you want to trade off resiliency? and all of these for these issues, that's, I guess, part of the question that you will, you will answer as we go on. So now, as what makes Buara worse is that this system, as my colleague from Water Supplies Department said, they are hidden, they are underground, uh, they are complex, they are large. In Hong Kong, 8,000 kilometers. I think in the Netherlands, more than 100,000 kilometers of pipes. In the US, they look at 2 million kilometers of pipes. The way we do checkups, we have to do checkups on these systems, cannot really, we cannot walk around to do checkups in a 2 million kilometer or a, or a 1,000 kilometer, which is in, in, underground. So the way that is done, if you can afford it, is often after a few years, you have to go back and take the pipes, put in new ones, and that cost us in Hong Kong 20 billions. In, U, in US and China, if they need to do the same, the estimates is more than 300 billion US dollars, okay? So these are staggering. The question is, when we do those, do we learn from the past? Do we learn at least we can do them better next? So this is, you may not agree with me here, but I'm gonna pose it and I'm gonna challenge you. I reckon that this is where we are in all of the urban water systems. We essentially achieved the limit of what technology and science can do. I reckon if we really need, need to be this limit, we need a new revolutions, okay? And I think the reason if you are having a lot of tough time is because we are reaching this limit. Yes, we can invest, but the increments are gonna be very small. We need a new way of thinking. Like a new way of thinking, though, is gonna bring us low. It will eventually get us there, but it breaks the limit, and that's the cycle. In all of the things that we went through, uh, if you read books, that's the way we go. So 
I know maybe you don't like it, it's challenging, that's why we have a session afterwards and you could correct me. We are lucky though in this, most of the time we blame politicians. We say, a politician, they are not giving us money, we want to do breakthrough research. But in this case, it seems that governments everywhere are ready to invest in this problem. So I think we are working in a lucky area, we are lucky, so we need to take advantage of it. So for very quickly what we do, at least in, in Hong Kong, that fits in. Uh, this is uh, one of the research projects. And this is really, it wouldn't materialize without our close collaboration with the water supplies department. Uh, this is again working together, managed to convince uh, the theme-based team that there is a worthwhile fundamental research to be done, but at the same time it could lead to potentially very exciting results. These are the other universities working with us. Uh, this is the team that we have, so again, international team uh, working with electrical engineers, mechanical, mathematicians, and so on. What do we want to do? I'm not going to go through details of this. Our hope is this, is we will do what doctors do when you, do, when you go for ultrasound. They set you on a table and they can look inside you and tell you what's going on. We are hoping to do that with underground in infrastructure. We're hoping to be able to image it. That is we're hoping to start to build the fundamental engineering and science that will one day hopefully get the engineer to be looking at their screen and they can look at their infrastructure and see what's going on. That's what our wish is. Uh, so I'll uh, skip this. Uh, and I just mentioned what I... To help us with this, we actually uh, built three... We have labs. We have labs in the university and some of our Dutch colleagues will come tomorrow and see the lab and see some of the things that I've uh, been uh, mentioning here. This is a lab in Italy to actually see, and sometimes we challenge each other. We, they send us blind tests and say, here, can you do this? Let's see how clever you are and so on. So it's, uh, it has been a good game. And then Gautau Kok, if you are driving by, you will see us spurting water and so on. We are not wasting water. Uh, we had. Uh, some challenges, people are scared sometimes, but that, it's us testing uh, some of these uh, technologies. This is also another unique working together. It's a WSD, HKUST uh, venture. They have this site here where they train uh, lots of their uh, technicians and engineers for leakage detection, the traditional ways. They allowed us to build the pipeline there so we can test what we are trying to, to do. Okay, so it's a a nice uh, facility as well. Now, that's what we are doing. Now, our colleagues, and uh, especially Dr. Miriam Blocker, she'll be talking to us about self-cleansing pipes, to, uh, how to improve it. She also has done research in drastic reduction in leaks, and also in pipe replacement. She's not going to speak, I think, about those. Uh, but uh, her background, she is the principal uh, scientist in Kiowa Water Research, KWR, so I know, uh, not just the abbreviation, I know the name, uh, Netherlands. Uh, she got her PhD in 2010. She actually comes from a physics background, uh, an undergraduate, I believe, or a master's, a master's in applied physics. Uh, we're lucky to have her in the water field. And she has a number of uh, projects, so I will not take uh, any more of your time. So Dr. Blacker, please. And I Okay, um, thank you very much. I'm really grateful to be here. I think you pronounce my name really well, so, but just <laughs> to keep reminding you, it's Miriam Blocker. Uh, I work with uh, KWR, um, and I thought it would be nice to just quickly introduce what KWR actually is. Um, so, in 1948, I think there were about 150 water companies in the Netherlands and they decided to team up. And they started Kiwa, which was really about certification of water-related articles, is, it was back then. Um, and then in 1971, they also decided to set up a joint research program. So that was where KWR was originally from. It was 
then found it. Um, and in 2006, Kiba let us go. So we split, and now it's just KWR. So originally we were Kiba Water Research, but we're not allowed to use that name anymore. So we're really KWR. <laughs> um, and um, we now have 10 drinking water companies. They're still in the joint research program, and we're so successful that even one from Belgium has joined us as well. So there are shareholders and there are prime, primary customers as well. Um, we're in this really great building since about four years, very transparent, very a lot of places where you can meet colleagues from all different uh, teams. So I'm down here uh, talking to one of my colleagues from the microbiology group. Uh, so there's lots of interactions with, with all the different aspects of drinking water and, and wastewater as well. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how drinking water is distributed in the Netherlands and some of its peculiarities uh, and why we have the best drinking water in the world. Um, we have a network of 120 thousand kilometers of pipes. Um, today that's about 50% plastic pipes, 30% is asbestos cement pipes that's decreasing and there's still about 10% of cast iron pipes that are usually the older pipes. Um, about 3%, 5% leakage, quite low. Um, the replacement rate is quite low as well. It's 0.5% per year but it is increasing. Uh, so to about 1%, so maybe the pipes will be 100 years old when they are placed on average. Uh, average pipe age, I didn't put it on, but it's about 45 to 50 years uh, right now. Um, and the research questions now are much more on how do we maintain this network. So in the past it was built uh, and it was much more on how do we build it, where do we get the money for building new networks, but now it's much more about keeping the, the best quality that we have. So which pipes need replacement and when do you replace it? And what do you replace them with? Um, so this is really a view of the Dutch utilities is when we replace a pipe, we don't just replace it with the same pipe, but we actually use it as an opportunity to improve our network even further uh, and really have a future-proof network. And of course, we also see lots of busy urban environments uh, where you have many other players in the underground and you have to work with them as well. It's also quite a challenge. Um, so some of the typical things for Dutch drinking water distribution, and I've put them into practice. So what's been going on for years and years and years, and then in the second column will be uh, what did research add to that, and then a third column on what sort of research do we still do. Um, I think one of the aspects that is really important is that there's been a focus on quality and long term. So it's not this cheap, quick fix solution. It's always a future view of and, and quality view. Um, I think also quite important, the fee that we pay for drinking water, about two euros per cubic meter, uh, really covers all costs. So there's no subsidies from the government. Um, Water utilities are let like a company, but they are actually in public hands. So their shareholders are municipalities and provinces. There's no residual chlorine in the system. Um, there's a low leakage, low burst rate, uh, and also quite a low number of customer complaints on water quality in general, but uh, specifically discoloration is quite a low number compared worldwide. Um, then what is going on right now, so the last 10 years, you can see that they really put um, a lot of the research results into practice. So one of the things is network design. Um, it's not just put in big pipes, uh, have plumbing expertise and add safety factor to safety factor, but really have a research-based vision on what a proper design of a system is and actually build that. Also network operations, we're looking much more on data that we've collected on valves, on hydrants, and use that for asset management and the same for network replacement, where we incorporate data from failure registration database, a national registration database, 
uh, inspection techniques, models, and insight into pipe degradation, pipe material degradation. And then I'll discuss a little bit about all of the, some of these topics, not all of them, I don't have the time. Um, and the current research is much uh, focused on asset management, um, also on water quality, demand modeling, and hydraulics modeling, um, and water quality modeling. Uh, as we do not use chlorine, we need biostable water, we need to make sure there's no contaminations or as little as possible and uh, do quantitative microbial risk analysis to keep that low. Um, and of course, sensors and sensor interpretation is very important uh, research topic nowadays. Um, so a little bit on the practice. Um, I put in two, but I think I'll talk more about the leakage than uh, the residual chlorine. So if you get the slides, you can read this, and there's a paper that connected to that. Um, but um, the low leakage, um, three to five percent, and we didn't really bring it down, it always was this low. Um, how did we do that? So um, in 2004, we did a project with UK companies that really didn't believe us when we said it was three percent. Uh, so they said suspiciously low, and we challenged them to find out how and why, if it was really true. Um, so we used both our methods um, of top-down and bottom-up estimation of uh, non-revenue water on a UK side and a Dutch side, compared them, and actually they, they seem to be quite, the same, quite uh, lead to the same result. Um, and we also did some exploration in the field in the Netherlands, tried to find leaks. And we didn't go to a, a place where we thought, oh, this is the best place. We, we went to somewhere where we thought there might be some leaks there, but we, did, we didn't really find them. Um, but they did come up with some explanations of why leakage is low. And instead of suspiciously, suspiciously low, they now say, okay, we, we believe you. And, uh, um, it was confirmed, but still maybe ridiculously low. Um, <laughs> so some of this is um, the different colors, and I'm not really sure exactly what it meant, but um, some of this uh, is related to the lucky circumstances that we have. So uh, there's low pressure because it's such a flat country. Um, the soil is very permittive. Uh, when there is a leak, water will just come up to the surface and you can quickly find it and, and repair it. Um, uh, the age is the age of the network is not that high. Um, low pressures, um, well, things like that. But there's also some good engineering practice that we found. Uh, and the best quote that I have is that somebody from the UK said, I wish that my engineers in the field would speak as good English as yours do, and ours are Dutch people. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite interesting to see that education uh, and, and there, everybody who works on a pipe really knows I'm working on public health good. It's, it's water quality is very important. So um, it helps and it does lead to low leakage because there's a connection for every household pipe and not everything clogged together, for example. So it's really good engineering practice there as well. Um, now a little bit on the design of a system uh, and the self-cleaning networks is something that is really very typically Dutch. All Dutch water utilities have implemented it. Um, some piloting is going on in Belgium and hopefully next year or this year in, in the UK. Um, but um, it's, it's a really good story, I believe. It's, and I really like to tell. Um, so there is discoloration, not very often, but once in a while you fill up a bath and you can see it and you can make a photograph. I've never seen it myself like this, but um, everybody knows it's at some point in your life you've seen this. Um, story in the whole world is it's from corroded pipes, right? That's, that's the reason why you have this and there's nothing you can do about it. But really, as I said in the beginning, there's only 10% cast iron pipes in our network. Can't really be just that. Um, besides, they're coated, it's called tar bitumen coatings. Most of them still intact, so it's not a lot of corroded pipes there. 
Um, so this was the first. First, it was a hypothesis. It must come from the treatment. There's particles coming in. Uh, and eventually, something happens in between during transport and distribution leading to this. Um, now it's not just a hypothesis. It's been extensively tested. And this is really what the true story is. Um, but you can also do something with that knowledge. So what it is is there's particles coming in from the treatment, just a few, but it's days by days, months, years uh, of loading the system. They will, in the system of hundreds of kilometers, just deposit. Um, and every now and then, when you would open a hydrant, you get a hydraulic event, and then it's resuspended, and that leads to discolored water. Um, so if you make sure that what goes in goes out, then you won't have this problem. And this is typically what all water utilities do, because they flush every three years, five years, 10 years, I don't know exactly. But the trick for the self-cleaning systems is that this balancing happens every day or every other day. So everything that settles during the night is resuspended during the morning peak. Uh, and there's really very small amounts, so you'll have the self-cleaning system. And that basically leads to uh, discolored water in the normal system and a really self-cleaning system um, in the, uh, the new design, where your disturbance, if you open a hydrant, is basically the same as what happens every day during your morning peak. So how do you do this? Um, you make sure that there are no locations where there's anything that can settle. So there is no flow direction reversals. It's a branch system. Velocity is high enough during the morning peak, so small pipe diameters. In the Dutch system, with the demands we have, that means uh, 110, 63, 40 millimeter pipes. And it might be a little bit larger here. <laughs> um, of course, don't use corroding pipe material. And you will see that still, once every year, we have a really high demand. You still have enough head available to deliver. Uh, all the water. And this is what that looks like in practice. So here's your very safe, secure, looped system, 250 millimeters and higher. Um, that uh, is the backbone. And then you branch off to 110. This here is not connected. And then it goes to 63, 40 millimeter pipes. Uh, and this is about 150 homes that are connected like that. They're still hydrants. Um, we build, a or the, the Bavin build a special hydrant that would fit onto a 63 millimeter pipe. This can still deliver 30 cubic meters per hour of fire, fire fighting capacity. And then after this, it will go directly into uh, the home. This means that there's, there's no dead end. It's a flowing end. So there's no dead ends in that system. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about the research that we're doing. Um, and the example is for asbestos cement pipes, but we do similar research on PVC pipes and other pipe materials. Um, so what we've done in the past, and I could almost have, well, I could have added a new figure to this. I'll talk to that. That relates actually to something that Mohammed just said. But um, so we look at pipe degra degradation mechanisms. So we really uh, look at the, the science behind uh, the degradation. Um, then we try to combine that with the failure registration data that we have. Um, there's a slide next to this. And we also look at uh, exit assessment and leaching, for example, here to see uh, with the pH test what the, uh, the strength wall of the wall still is. Uh, and you can even correlate that with inspection with georadar, echo poles, ultrasound. Um, and the graph that next time I'll put here is a CT scan, because we actually put AC pipes into a CT scanner. You said uh, you wanted to have the full image of your system. Well, we, well, of course, you have to excavate it and then put it in the MRI or the CT scanner. But um, we have uh, uh, a really nice view of what that pipe actually looks like. Um, so this gives us really a lot of insight. 
of how AC pipes degrade over time. Um, and this will help to, uh, for the utilities to estimate when to replace which pipe uh, and really do this in a, a cost optimal way. Um, the failure registration database that we have and this slide is from October 2016, sorry. But uh, back then, we had 18,000 bursts uh, registered, so there's more than 20,000 now. Eight of the drinking water companies are contributing since about five, six, seven years. Um, and this was, was under development. The quality system is now in place, so the data quality is guaranteed. There's a, a system of how good the data quality is, what's put in. Um, and the Belgium company is, is still joining, I guess. <laughs> um, and what we can see here, for example, is a failure frequency of AC pipes in purple and then the number of uh, failures that were registered. Uh, and you can either look at it per age group or per installation date, which might also be important. Um, you can also see how different soil types around the pipes would affect it. So there's more corrosive uh, soil types that would affect um, aging of AC pipes. This graph here shows for different installation times for one of the water companies um, the number of failures in PVC in the pipes, in the darker color, and the lighter color is uh, the PVC joints. So. Um, we can also uh, compare those. Uh, so this is a, a really treasure of data and it's, it's still growing. Uh, and as I showed before, failure, or failure rate is quite low, but water utilities teaming up, collecting all the data together, really give them a lot of insight, not just on their own pipes, but for the whole of the Netherlands and collect a lot more insight a lot quicker than they would with just their own data. Um, so I told you a little bit about how water utilities work in the Netherlands, uh, their view on quality, their, uh, their view on research. They, they contribute, they, they, they invest in that, they actually use it, and more research is still being done together with them in the joint research program. Uh, and this really leads to, to water that looks good, is clear, uh, that tastes good, there's no chlorine, people drink from the tap really. Um, it's always available, more or less, um, and it's not expensive at all. So with that, I really like to thank you for your attention. I think this is the time we sit over there. Oh. And uh, with us as well, Dr. Uh, King Wong. He's the executive president of International Institute of Utility Specialist. And he's also the CEO of Utility Info. He also comes in with a mix of engineering and business background. So, yes. And uh, that is needed. Money is always uh, yes. the final say in all of these. <laughs> so uh, perhaps... Uh, Mr. Lee, I'll start with you to uh, see if you have any general uh, comments that fits with the theme. Okay. Um, and then I will open the floor, of course, for questions, right? Okay. Unless you feel like you want to leave. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Johnson. Um, actually, I'm the acting chief engineer. Um, I'm a uh, present rank senior engineer by acting for the chief. Uh, first of all, uh, we are pleased to have the, the opportunity to join uh, this section. And I must uh, say that uh, that could be a lot of uh, experience that we could uh, share with each other with the uh, Dutch practice as well as uh, the Hong Kong practice. Uh, drawing from the reference from what uh, Dr. Brookhurst has shared with us, uh, I would also like to highlight uh, some of the differences between Hong mm -hmm. Kong and, and, and the uh, left dance. Uh, first of all, I noticed that uh, you'll use a lot of plastic pipe. 50% uh, uh, in Netherlands. Uh, comparing with this figure in Hong Kong, uh, we use, uh, on the contrary, we use a lot of uh, metallic pipes, chiefly because uh, we, we have uh, pipe di diameters uh, as high as two meters. 
Uh, so our pipes is very, I think uh, our pipes uh, are relatively large, uh, chiefly because our population is quite high. We have uh, 7 million pe people in Hong Kong, whereas I think uh, Amsterdam like, uh, has uh, 1 million more people. Okay, uh, so uh, our population density is quite high. And then uh, secondly, I think uh, we, we share with each other, we are our coastal uh, city and countries. But in Hong Kong, you, as you can see from the beautiful landscape, just around Victoria Harbor, we have uh, quite a hilly terrain. Uh, actually, uh, one third of our land has been developed. And other land are actually not well developed because they are country parks, because they are hill, hill, hilly terrain. So of course, the, the, as you can, the Dutch people can notice, uh, the most expensive uh, houses actually located on the hills. Uh, but, also as, uh, 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 but also some of the public housing actually located on the hills. So as, as the water supply department, we not only need to cater for those living in a relatively low area, we also need to cater for those li uh, living in the uh, uh, hilly terrain, whether you are you are rich people or those living in the public housing. So that, that would mean that our water supply pressure is, is high. Uh, I understand that um, the supply pressure in, in Lebanon <clears throat> is relatively low, but on the contrary, in order to cater for those uh, living in the hilly terrain, we need to have a quite high water supply pressure. Uh, actually, uh, we, our supply pressure ranges from 40 meters to, uh, to 90 meters. So uh, there's some differences between Hong Kong and Netherlands. And also I noticed that um, uh, some of the water mains are actually uh, pay, uh, located underground, uh, but, uh, but it's in the sandy uh, pavement or open pavement. That would be easy for visible leaves. Uh, but on the uh, contrary, Hong Kong has a problem because uh, Hong Kong people, uh, because we are quite congested, uh, the, pave, the area in Hong Kong is usually paved concrete pave. And also some of the water mains are actually located uh, on the uh, road pavement uh, carriageway. So that would pose some difficulties for us to inspect the lease and, and, for, for, and also maintain uh, the, the water pipe. Um, so uh, there's a, a few major observation that, that I, I noticed uh, from the, the differences between Hong Kong and Netherlands. Of course, uh, our, we, we can share more if we each other about, about our experience. And uh, I would rather stop here and then uh, look forward to more opportunity to share with uh, the audience and the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, King Wong uh, from IIUS. Uh, uh, it will be quite new to you, called IIUS, International Institute of Utility Specialists, while we set up five years ago in Hong Kong, headquartered in Hong Kong. And our current president is uh, Professor Eric Ma. Uh, Hong Kong people knows him, uh, our last Secretary for Development. Um, I'm currently the Executive President. We have 30 Vice Presidents or local rep from different countries on all the major continents. So uh, we have four major works. One is uh, standard setting, secondly is cost accreditation, thirdly is personnel recognition. And talking about this point, uh, we need to talk about the membership later on. And fourthly is the promotion, uh, professional promotion on the industry, on utility specialists. Uh, utilities is not something new to all here, uh, but utility specialists who are working dirty, dark, like me, uh, I call myself the man in black or man in dark, because I was always, I am always working underground, uh, so that you, you cannot see me. But uh, we now want to uh, make uh, people know about the, business, uh, the, the profession, uh, that uh, we are helping you, whether you're from EPD, whether you're from DSD, whether you're from WSD, or whether you're from the university, like HKUST. Uh, yes, we are helping you all there, in different aspects regarding utilities. And uh, we do have local institutes, uh, which I was the convener uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so I, I, although I look not that old, but... <laughs> you are young. You are young. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> so I've been in the industry for more than 25 years now. Uh, so that's it, uh, my background. And it is very lucky today. Uh, I was not aware of such a big event. 
uh, by HKUST. Uh, I remember the first time I went to UST, I think it was in 94 or 95. Uh, when it was uh, uh, not open, uh, open not long ago, uh, from from opening on, in ninety first, uh, ninety one, uh, I asked for a research project, and the professor from the environmental department uh, or environment department uh, told me that he needs two years for a intermediate result. Then I walked away. <laughs> so uh, then I realized, yes, research takes time, and and in Hong Kong, uh, government do ask a lot of uh, research from us. But uh, we are private or we are small entities that we cannot afford to do all the research and leave it to all the universities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just one question, I guess, to both or the three of you. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I know in Europe and in South Africa, they relaxed a lot the fire requirements. Right, to be able to reduce pipe diameter so they can get smaller. So you, they allow you to build this 50 and 60 and 70 millimeters. In the US and Canada, you cannot go below 150. It doesn't matter because insurance have a lot to say, <laughs> right? And insurance is not easily movable. So they realize that they could do similar things, but essentially they are finding it very difficult. From your, how did you guys do it in <laughs> Europe? <laughs> and what is Hong Kong doing about it? Uh, I guess we'll hear from Dr. Blocker first. I, I have one. Um, there was a lot of discussion with the fire departments. Uh, I think insurance was not a big party in this. Um, but uh, since the 1980s, there's been new building regulations and a lot of fire retardant materials being used and also the things, the couches or the, the, the curtains that you buy all have fire retardant materials. Um, so that was really the way to convince them. Uh, and I think we also did some testing that most of the fires are actually put out with the fire that the fire department brings in their own truck. Um, so um, for regular houses, but that's not the high-rise building, 30 cubic meters per hour was acceptable in, in the new standards. Okay. Right. Mr. Lee? Well, um, I'm from Water Supply Department, but uh, I can't speak for uh, the water, uh, Fire Services Department. But, no, but what, is, what is the allowable? What is the minimum allowable? Right? Are you still following the North American criteria, or is it now more relaxed? Well, uh, as far as I understand, uh, our supply pressure must be high enough for the firefighting purposes, around 30 meters. Uh, minimum. Minimum. minimum yeah. uh, in, on the street. So, the, so uh, what we can relax is because Hong Kong has a lot of high-rise buildings. Most of the buildings are actually high-rise. So it's not easy for us to, uh, for, for, I think for, for the government to relax the, the, the requirement. That's the difficulties, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, can I also yeah, ask? Yeah, sure. the, the fire department in the Netherlands, their purpose is to save lives, not to save buildings. <laughs> well, uh, yes, you're right. Yeah. The, the mid, I've, what I mean is uh, they still have uh, the fire service uh, requirement for the buildings. But uh, as long as uh, the pressure we supply should be high enough for the firefighting purpose, whether we can risk recruiting for the people or for the building itself. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to take any question. I have a couple of more, but I think uh, that is, it will be good to take some questions from the floor. Any questions? Comments? Um, I have a question for Miriam. Uh, I promise, correct me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, you've mentioned that the uh, the, uh, the British came to the Netherlands and questioning about that um, uh, surprisingly low, <laughs> yeah, uh, suspiciously low. Yeah, suspiciously low. <laughs> and in that sense, the so after that, they, I, I guess they will somehow come up with some mitigations or, uh, for their own systems. Or do you know anything they want to like improve or learn it from the, the Dutch? Um. Well, I think they realized that their goals for their own leakage could be a lot lower than they set them at first. Um, I think they have a few areas that 
in, in the UK, like in the South East, that are more like the Netherlands, that have lower leakage rates. Um, but um, I think a problem in the UK is that hardly they even know where their pipes are, let alone where the leaks are. So uh, <laughs> they have other challenges still. But I think in new, I think where they put in new networks, I think they pay more attention to prevent leakage. And just uh, another curious question. Uh, how about the remaining 3% of leakage? Uh, what are those? So how, <laughs> how why are there still 3%? Or do, you kn do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think some of the leaks are actually not leaking onto the street, but into the surface water. So some of those that you can't really <coughs> easily find. Um, really small leaks when they first start. Or measurement errors. We don't really know exactly because 3% is really difficult to assess. Yes. Maybe, uh, Mr. Engineer Lee, you can tell a little bit about uh, the number of water losses in uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I've been here now for two days, and there was always water in the in the uh, in the tap in the hotel, but also in other places. And I think the water quality is quite well, quite good. And uh, yeah, I also drink the water from the tap, and I'm still fine. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not all places in the world. So I think you have very good services. But I'm curious about what your challenges are. Where are you focusing on uh, at this moment? OK, uh, thank you, gentlemen. And thanks for trusting uh, our service. Uh, I just would like to, uh, before, before I I'm, uh, would like to elaborate more, I, I just would like to uh, uh, tell you man, one more thing about uh, Hong Kong's water supply system. That is, uh, we, uh, as a government department, we actually not only supply water, we are actually the authority. We do planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance by solely a government department. I think, it's a, I think uh, it is quite different from uh, those in Netherlands, and I'm I, I'm telling you that it's not a diff, it's a difficult job, from from the point of view to operate and maintenance all these using purely the civil servant to do so. Um, just would like to share with you more uh, our water supply uh, are actually up to the uh, World Health Organization standard, and uh, so uh, some of the people are not confident uh, whether they they, are, they can train from tap purely because of the inside surfaces. That, what, what I mean is those pipe surfaces inside the building. Uh, I'm sure that you are living in, in a quite a re reputable hotel, so I think the uh, water uh, quality management inside the hotel should be good enough. Uh, of, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not encouraged all of you guys to drink from the tap, <laughs> but I just uh, I, I assure you that, assure that our water quality supply from the treatment plant are up to the World Health Organization Center. And you, to elaborate more, uh, and I'm, I think you may be interested in uh, the leakage uh, or the pipe web situation in Hong Kong. Um, um, actually, uh, I learned from uh, Dr. Brooker that uh, uh, Leverance has a pipe replacement program, uh, in particular for the AC pipes. I uh, would like to share more about Hong Kong experience. And in two. In the year 2000, uh, we embarked a uh, pipe rehabilitation and replacement program. And in 15 years, that is uh, up to 2015, we have actually replaced and rehabilitated uh, 3,000 kilometers water pipes, out of uh, 8,000 uh, kilometer water pipes. Actually, it is uh, more than one third of our water pipe supply system. And, and in the past, in two year uh, 2000, when I was all, actually a graduate, uh, a, a student studying with uh, Professor Lee in University of Hong Kong. <laughs> At that time, our, actually our main birth incident was quite high. We have uh, 2,500 cases per day, uh, per, per year, sorry, per year, <laughs> per year, yeah. But, but, uh, but with a lot of efforts from, uh, from our colleagues and also with the partners in, this, uh, in the industry, Actually, our main person's cases reduced to 100 cases per year in the year 2018. So that's a huge uh, improvement for us. Um, for the leakage rate, uh, I think you are quite interested in that. Uh, in, I, I must uh, say that uh, our leakage rate is not as good as 
uh, the performance in Lebanon with 15% leakage rate in Hong Kong for the government mains. Um, I'm not saying that this is a, this is a good figure, uh, but I compare with, with the uh, figures uh, shown in the Dr. Booker's presentation. Actually, we are ranking among the third in Europe. We are actually not performing that bad <laughs> compared with other European countries. But I, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a uh, figure that we must, uh, we are powering of that. I'm not saying that. Uh, a lot of experience that we are actually learn from the uh, overseas, uh, uh, if the stakeholder and partners in the industry. So we will continue to do more, including, uh, including the uh, establishing the water intelligence network uh, that has been presented by my assistant director before. We are also doing uh, some uh, underground assessment, uh, asset management strategies to particularly replace those uh, mains which have check, uh, we have bad record of main births and those material who, which are uh, prone to failure. We have actually a, a similar program, but in a lesser extent than before. So that, that is what our experience in Hong Kong, and we look forward to learn more or share more with, uh, with you and other uh, colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is a question for Dr. Blocker. You know, you, you, you mentioned this self-cleaning network. It's very interesting. Uh, but I'm just wondering, I mean, so suppose you have households that haven't used the water for a while, you still would, would have problems, right? I mean, the reason we are asked is because you know, we are lately, you know, a few years back, we had some lead uh, contamination problems. So, so it's kind of, you know, my, so that's the first question is, uh, this self-cleans, do you, do you think, because really, I mean, even now you turn on a tap and if the pipe size is sufficiently small, it will meet your, your criterion of 0.2 meter per second. In general, it will. But it may not, I mean, you can't say we guarantee there's no you know, rust or whatever. It's very difficult. Uh, so I, just a general question. Of, and related question is at KWR, uh, do you do research on corrosion chemistry? Because in the literature, actually, there's not much work. I mean, people lost interest. Uh, you know, it's not, not a lot of work being done. So I think we, we tried actually, uh, we'd like to learn some more on this be, because of this, you know, this self-cleaning network. Yeah. I mean, it would be very interesting. Um, so the self-cleaning network was really designed to make sure that the discoloration problem is no longer there. Um, and of course, we are also looking into the effect on microbiology and maybe leaching of chemicals or, or metals into it. Um, so if you have somebody who doesn't take water for, for during their vacation and when they return, we, we do advise let the tap run for a while. Uh, and, and so we still do that. Uh, lead pipes have all been replaced, well, maybe. A a few pipes are still left, but, but mainly all lead pipes have been replaced. So we did a lot of research when there was still lead pipes there. And there are still <laughs> colleagues that work with KWR that have that knowledge. But there's not a lot of research going on now on, on corrosion and, and lead pipes uh, today. But, uh, but we do have a lot of knowledge and we do have a lot of Dutch reports but haven't been translated yet. So we might have something that, that could be of interest for you that, that we could translate or something. Yeah, I, I think just a, uh, a general comment. Right? Uh, the, the leak, when it happens, is really the system tells you that I have a weakness, right? <laughs> that either you did poor engineering there or you did poor hydraulics, and it's trying to find a relief point. And if the only thing you do is go back and fix it without learning from it, uh, in many jurisdictions, they found the problem actually can become worse. <laughs> so it's not about plugging them only. It's about learning what caused them, why there, why in that location. And I'm interested to see utilities, all of you, your point of view is in when you approach this problem after you deal with this problem. What do you do afterwards? So that's the experience. Maybe uh, with you and then we'll... I, I quite agree. So that's why we have that national failure registration database where we really put in the data. So we ask the people that 
fix the problem to also do their forensic diagnosis or something. So what was going on is what might have caused it. Was it a third party that, that broke it or is it a joint or uh, do you see any corrosion there? Do you see any roots from, from trees? Or So all that sort of information is captured. Uh, and then every year or so, we, we run an analysis and try to find uh, common denominators that, that could explain and that can tell us how pipes degrade and what common causes are and what you can do about that. Uh, for underground utilities, if you're asking for a complete solution, I think first of all, uh, all the utilities need to be worked together, first of all. Say for example, we've been uh, researching for common uh, utility enclosure for more than 20 years, but we still haven't have uh, a complete, uh, not a complete, a small scale one in Hong Kong, despite we, s we do have some trials in Hong Kong. And that happens in China that uh, they invest uh, talking about uh, hundreds of billions of dollars to do the common utility enclosures. That's first of all. Secondly, of course, uh, uh, Johnson has mentioned uh, we have high pressure uh, water supply here in Hong Kong because of, uh, yeah, of our natural terrain and our, our high-rise building. And so we need to have standards suitable for the local. Uh, PVC pipe always is not uh, quite good in Hong Kong situation. And thirdly, it's about the public education. Uh, so we all today here, uh, we listening to different people talking about different things about urban water management. And indeed, uh, there could be much more. And of course, from the university, uh, students, they can learn more uh, and to help the public to develop something new. Uh, so next one is uh, research and development. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, uh, I am not that uh, optimistic uh, as compared with my, my uh, again, my teacher, Professor Joseph Lee. I'm, I'm also <laughs> your student. <laughs> so, uh, from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, um, I see the research projects in Hong Kong sometimes uh, spend a lot of time uh, on a small area, uh, very specific, but uh, not something generic to help the general public. And uh, as a researcher, you may have hesitation to do a gen generic research because you cannot publish. That, that is a contradiction uh, between two things. And we as a private company, we, we would like to do more generic things or as institute, we also do a lot of promotion on this one. But uh, we do not have the funds. So <laughs> there, there are gaps uh, we need to uh, fill. Uh, that is about public education. Of course, uh, lastly, uh, the authority has to say, uh, if they want to go for three percent, uh, we can find out a way. And yes, the public, I mean, the, the uh, all of us, the citizens, need to know, uh, understand. Uh, we need to pay a little bit on on the cost. That's uh, my personal view. Thank you. Thanks. Well, um, in fact, uh, we must. Um, I, I think we, we must understand the the inherent situation in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and I elaborate before the, the differences between the left and Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> the inherent problem for Hong Kong, and then also our supply pressure is high. So that poses difficulty for us to further lower down the leakage rate. And, and as what regards uh, what we are done, we are doing, we are building up our water intelligence network and dividing Hong Kong's network into 2,000 more uh, district meter area. Uh, meter areas, and through those areas, we can know which region or which area are suffering water loss. Um, and then uh, we used uh, some uh, leak detection method. Uh, I think King has a lot of experience uh, to do the leak detection in Hong Kong. And uh, that is built up chiefly by acoustic mean and for the metallic pipe. Uh, but I, I must uh, share with you that uh, the difficulties uh, sometimes for, for Hong Kong to repair those leaks is because the difficulty to open the road. That is, some of our leaks actually detected are located in the middle of the carriageway. We can't close the road during the daytime most of the time. And during the night time, when we open the road, we need to fix it very quickly without disturbing the residents nearby. So all these are uh, difficulties for us uh, to, to handle those leaks. And 
of course, uh, we are working with a lot of uh, research institutes, including uh, USD and, and also uh, other uh, uh, consultants to develop new ways, new to look for new technology to handle those needs and to repair those uh, leaks quickly. So we are actually uh, working with the partners in the industry and, and so as to uh, further enhance our network and then to uh, drive down the leakage rate. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Blocker, one quick question. The 18,000 bursts, was that per year that no. you mentioned? No, that was five years, six years of data. Okay. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, For, I, uh, otherwise it looked uh, a bit uh, yeah. on the high side. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. For the whole of the yeah. Netherlands. Huh? So. Any last burning question? No, I know it's getting late. <laughs> three, three minutes, they tell me. That means we... <laughs> no, I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's time. I think uh, the, my interest in leak was when I heard about Belgium and other places building pipeline for beers. <laughs> So I like, I, like to find, I like to find where the leaks are. <laughs> uh, so that there are actually real pipelines. They are pumped, you know, and that's another application for us as researchers. Uh, anyway, uh, on behalf of uh, the maybe Dutch one, Council... Uh, so uh, sure. Maybe one more thing I would like to share uh, with uh, people, pa particularly <laughs> those uh, in evidence. Uh, Hong Kong not only build uh, fresh water pipe, uh, we also build seawater sea sea water pipe. Uh, for the, the guy in, uh, just you, you in the hotel, uh, which region are you uh, staying at? <laughs> Don't use the salt one. <laughs> one chai. So I think the uh, flushing, the toilet flushing, the water. Try. You didn't try. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's salt water. It's salt water. So we pump the water from the sea to do the flushing. And it's actually an, an initiative in the old days. And then uh, with particular uh, emphasis to save the water. Uh, that's one point that I would like to. One more point that I would like to share with you about Hong Kong experience. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm told that this is all videotaped. So uh, I think after they uh, gather all of it, they will send it to all of you. So you'll be hearing from uh, the organizers uh, from USD. Uh, on behalf of uh, the. Dutch Consulate and uh, USD, we'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, for being part of this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.